Prelude to Foundation by Isaac Asimov Read by Larry A. McKeever Sunmaster Sunmaster 14 A leader of the Mycogen sector of ancient Trantor As is true of all the leaders of this ingrown sector, little is known of him. That he plays any role at all in history is due entirely to his interrelationship with Harry Selden in the course of the flight. Encyclopedia Galactica 35. There were just two seats behind the compact pilot compartment, and when Selden sat down on padding that gave slowly beneath him, meshed fabric came forward to encircle his legs, waist, and chest and a hood came down over his forehead and ears. He felt imprisoned, and when he turned to his left with difficulty, and only slightly, he could see that Doors was similarly enclosed. The pilot took his own seat and checked the controls. Then he said, I'm Endor Levanian at your service. You're enmeshed because there will be a considerable acceleration at liftoff. Once we're in the open and flying, you'll be released. You needn't tell me your names. It's none of my business. He turned in his seat and smiled at them out of a gnome-like face that wrinkled as his lips spread outward. Any psychological difficulties, youngsters? Doris said lightly, I'm an outworlder, and I'm used to flying. That is also true for myself said Selden, with a bit of hauteur. Excellent, youngsters. Of course, this isn't your ordinary air jet, and you may not have done any night flying, but I'll count on you to bear up. He was enmeshed, too, but Selden could see that his arms were entirely free. A dull hum sounded inside the jet, growing in intensity and rising in pitch. Without actually becoming unpleasant, it threatened to do so, and Selden made a gesture as though to shake his head and get the sound out of his ears, but the attempt to do so merely seemed to stiffen the hold of the head mesh. The jet then sprang, it was the only verb Selden could find to describe the event, into the air, and he found himself pushed hard against the back and bottom of his seat. Through the windshield in front of the pilot, Selden saw with a twinge of horror the flat rise of a wall, and then a round opening appear in that wall. It was similar to the hole into which the air taxi had plunged the day he and Hummon had left the Imperial sector, but though this one was large enough for the body of the jet, it certainly did not leave room for the wings. Selden's head turned as far to the right as he could manage, and did so just in time to see the wing on his side wither and collapse. The jet plunged into the opening and was seized by the electromagnetic field and hurtled along a lighted tunnel. The acceleration was constant, and there were occasional clicking noises that Selden imagined might be the passing of individual magnets. And then, in less than ten minutes, the jet was spewed out into the atmosphere, headlong into the sudden pervasive darkness of night. The jet decelerated as it passed beyond the electromagnetic field, and Selden felt himself flung against the mesh and plastered there for a few breathless moments. Then the pressure ceased, and the mesh disappeared altogether. How are you, youngsters? came the cheerful voice of the pilot. I'm not sure, said Selden. He turned to Doors. Are you all right? Certainly, she answered. I think Mr. Levanian was putting us through his paces to see if we were really outworlders. Is that so, Mr. Levanian? Some people like excitement, said Levanian. Do you? Within limits, said Doors. Then Selden added approvingly as any reasonable person would admit. Selden went on. It might have seemed less humorous to you, sir, if you had ripped the wings off the jet. Impossible, sir. I told you this is not your ordinary air jet. 
the wings are thoroughly computerized. They change their length, width, curvature, and overall shape to match the speed of the jet, the speed and direction of the wind, the temperature, and half a dozen other variables. The wings wouldn't tear off unless the jet itself was subjected to stresses that would splinter it. There was a spatter against Selden's window. He said, It's raining. It often is, said the pilot. Selden peered out the window. On Helicon or on any other world, there would have been lights visible, the illuminated works of man. Only on Trantor would it be dark. Well, not entirely. At one point he saw the flash of a beacon light. Perhaps the higher reaches of Upperside had warning lights. As usual, Doris took note of Selden's uneasiness. Patting his hand, she said, I'm sure the pilot knows what he's doing, Harry. I'll try to be sure of it too, Doris, but I wish he'd share some of that knowledge with us, Selden said in a voice loud enough to be overheard. I don't mind sharing, said the pilot. To begin with, we're heading up, and we'll be above the cloud deck in a few minutes. Then there won't be any rain, and we'll even see the stars. He had timed the remark beautifully, for a few stars began to glitter through the feathery cloud remnants, and then all the rest sprang into brightness as the pilot flicked off the lights inside the cabin. Only the dim illumination of his own instrument panel remained to compete, and outside the window the sky sparkled brightly. Doris said, That's the first time in over two years that I've seen the stars. Aren't they marvelous? They're so bright, and there are so many of them. The pilot said, Trentor is nearer the center of the galaxy than most of the outer worlds. Since Helicon was in a sparse corner of the galaxy, and its star field was dim and unimpressive, Selden found himself speechless. Nora said, How quiet this flight has become. So it is, said Selden. What powers the jet, Mr. Levanian? A microfusion motor and a thin stream of hot gas. I didn't know we had working microfusion air jets. They talk about it, but... There are a few small ones like this. So far they exist only on Trantor and are used entirely by high government officials. Selden said, The fees for such travel must come high. Very high, sir. How much is Mr. Humman being charged, then? There's no charge for this flight. Mr. Humman is a good friend of the company who owns these jets. Selden grunted. Then he asked, Why aren't there more of these microfusion air jets? Too expensive for one thing, sir. Those that exist fulfill all the demand. You could create more demand with larger jets. Maybe so, but the company has never managed to make microfusion engines strong enough for large air jets. Selden thought of Humman's complaint that technological innovation had declined to a low level. Decadent, he murmured. What? said Doris. Nothing, said Selden. I was just thinking of something Humman once said to me. He looked out at the stars and said, Are we moving westward, Mr. Levanian? Yes, we are. How did you know? Because I thought that we would see the dawn by now if we were heading east to meet it. But dawn, pursuing the planet, finally caught up with them, and sunlight, real sunlight, brightened the cabin walls. It didn't last long, however, for the jet curved downward and into the clouds. Blue and gold vanished, and were replaced by dingy gray, and both Selden and Doors emitted disappointed cries at being deprived of even a few more moments of true sunlight. When they sank beneath the clouds, Upper Side was immediately below them, and its surface, at least at this spot, was a rolling mixture of wooded grottoes and intervening grassland. 
It was the sort of thing Clausia had told Selden existed on Upperside. Again, there was little time for observation, however. An opening appeared below them, rimmed by lettering that spelled mycogen. They plunged in. 36. They landed at a jet port that seemed deserted to Selden's wondering eyes. The pilot, having completed his task, shook hands with both Harry and Doors and took his jet up into the air with a rush, plunging it into an opening that appeared for his benefit. There seemed then nothing to do but wait. There were benches that could seat perhaps a hundred people, but Selden and Doris Van Abelie were the only two people around. The port was rectangular, surrounded by walls in which there must be many tunnels that could open to receive or deliver jets. But there were no jets present after their own had departed, and none arrived while they waited. There were no people arriving, or any indications of habitation. The very life hum of Trantor was muted. Selden felt this aloneness to be oppressive. He turned to Doris and said, What is it that we must do here? Have you any idea? Doris shook her head. Hummond told me we would be met by Sun Master Fourteen. I don't know anything beyond that. Sun Master Fourteen. What would that be? A human being, I presume. From the name, I can't be certain whether it would be a man or a woman. An odd name. Oddity is in the mind of the receiver. I am sometimes taken to be a man by those who have never met me. What fools they must be, said Selden, smiling. Not at all. Judging from my name, they are justified. I'm told it is a popular masculine name on various worlds. I've never encountered it before. That's because you aren't much of a galactic traveler. The name Harry is common enough everywhere, although I once knew a woman named Harry, pronounced like your name but spelled with an E. In Mycogen, as I recall, particular names are confined to families and numbered. But Sunmaster seems so unrestrained a name. What's a little braggadocio? Back on Cinna, Doors is from an old local expression meaning spring gift. Because you were born in the spring? No, I first saw the light of day at the height of Cinna's summer. But the name struck my people as pleasant, regardless of its traditional and largely forgotten meaning. In that case, perhaps Sunmaster. And a deep, severe voice said, That is my name, tribesman. Selden, startled, looked to his left. An open ground car had somehow drawn close. It was boxy and archaic, looking almost like a delivery wagon. In it, at the controls, was a tall old man who looked vigorous despite his age. With stately majesty, he got out of the ground car. He wore a long white gown with voluminous sleeves pinched in at the wrists. Beneath the gown were soft sandals from which the big toe protruded, while his head, beautifully shaped, was completely hairless. He regarded the two calmly with his deep blue eyes. He said, I greet you, tribesmen. Selden said with automatic politeness, Greeting, sir. Then, honestly puzzled, he asked, How did you get in? Through the entrance which closed behind me. You paid little heed. I suppose we didn't. But then we didn't know what to expect. Nor do we now. Tribesman Chetter Hummon informed the brethren that there would be members from two of the tribes arriving. He asked that you be cared for. Then you know Hummon. We do. He has been of service to us. And because he, a worthy tribesman, has been of service to us, so must we be now to him. There are few who come to Mycogen, 
and few who leave. I am to make you secure, give you house room, see that you are undisturbed. You will be safe here. Doris bent her head. We are grateful, Sunmaster Fourteen. Sunmaster turned to look at her with an air of dispassionate contempt. I am not unaware of the customs of the tribes, he said. I know that among them a woman may well speak before being spoken to. I am therefore not offended. I would ask her to have a care among others of the brethren who may be of lesser knowledge in the matter. Oh, really? said Doris, who was clearly offended, even if Sunmaster was not. In truth, agreed Sunmaster. Nor is it needful to use my numerical identifier when I alone of my cohort am with you. Sunmaster will be sufficient. Now, I will ask you to come with me so that we may leave this place, which is of too tribal a nature to comfort me. Comfort is for all of us, said Selden, perhaps a little more loudly than was necessary. And we will not budge from this place unless we are assured that we will not be forcibly bent to your liking against our own natures. It is our custom that a woman may speak whenever she has something to say. If you have agreed to keep us secure, that security must be psychological as well as physical. Sunmaster gazed at Selden levelly and said, You are bold, young tribesman. Your name? I am Harry Selden of Helicon. My companion is Doris Venabili of Sinna. Sunmaster bowed slightly as Selden pronounced his own name, did not move at the mention of Dora's name. He said, I have sworn to tribesman Hummon that we will keep you safe, so I will do what I can to protect your woman companion in this. If she wishes to exercise her impudence, I will do my best to see that she is held guiltless. Yet in one respect you must conform and he pointed with infinite scorn, first to Selden's head, and then to Doris. What do you mean? said Selden. Your cephalic hair. What about it? It must not be seen. Do you mean we're to shave our heads like you? Certainly not. My head is not shaven, tribesman Selden. I was depilated when I entered puberty, as are all the brethren and their women. If we're talking about depilation, then more than ever the answer is no, never. Tribesmen, we ask neither shaving nor depilation. We ask only that your hair be covered when you are among us. How? I have brought skin caps that will mold themselves to your skulls, together with strips that will hide the super-optical patches, the eyebrows. You will wear them while with us. And, of course, tribesman Selden, you will shave daily, or oftener if that becomes necessary. But why must we do this? Because, to us, hair on the head is repulsive and obscene. Surely you and all your people know that it is customary for others in all the worlds of the galaxy to retain their cephalic hair. We know, and those among us, like myself, who must deal with tribesmen now and then, must witness this hair. We manage, but it is unfair to ask the brethren generally to suffer the sight. Selden said, Very well then, Sun Master, but tell me, since you were born with cephalic hair, as all of us are, and as you all retain it visibly till puberty, why is it so necessary to remove it? Is it just a matter of custom, or is there some rationale behind it? And the old Mycogenian said proudly, By depilation we demonstrate to the youngster that he or she has become an adult, and through depilation adults will always remember who they are, and never forget that all others are but tribesmen. 
He waited for no response, and in truth, Selden could think of none, but brought out from some hidden compartment in his robe a handful of thin bits of plastic of varying color, stared keenly at the two faces before him, holding first one strip, then another, against each face. The colors must match reasonably, he said. No one will be fooled into thinking you are not wearing a skin cap, but it must not be repulsively obvious. Finally, Sunmaster gave a particular strip to Selden and showed him how it could be pulled out into a cap. Please put it on, tribesman Selden, he said. You will find the process clumsy at first, but you will grow accustomed to it. Selden put it on, but the first two times it slipped off when he tried to pull it backward over his hair. Begin just above your eyebrows, said Sunmaster. His fingers seemed to twitch as though eager to help. Selden said, suppressing a smile, Would you do it for me? And Sunmaster drew back, saying almost in agitation, I couldn't. I would be touching your hair. Selden managed to hook it on and followed Sunmaster's advice, in pulling it here and there until all his hair was covered. The eyebrow patches fitted on easily. Doors, who had watched carefully, put hers on without trouble. How does it come off? asked Selden. You have but to find an end, and it will peel off without trouble. You will find it easier both to put on and take off if you cut your hair shorter. I'd rather struggle a bit, said Selden. Then, turning to Doors, he said in a low voice, you're still pretty, Doors, but it does tend to remove some of the character from your face. The character is there underneath just the same, she answered. And I dare say you'll grow accustomed to the hairless me. In a still lower whisper, Selden said, I don't want to stay here long enough to get accustomed to this. Sunmaster, who ignored with visible haughtiness the mumblings among mere tribesmen, said, If you will enter my ground car, I will now take you into Mycogen. 37. Frankly, whispered Doors, I can scarcely believe I'm on Trantor. I take it, then, you've never seen anything like this before, said Selden. I've only been on Trantor for two years, and I've spent much of my time at the university, so I'm not exactly a world traveler. Still, I've been here and there, and I've heard of this and that, but I've never seen or heard of anything like this. The sameness. Sunmaster drove along methodically and without undue haste. There were other wagon-like vehicles in the roadway all with hairless men at the controls, their bald pates gleaming in the light. On either side there were three-story structures, unornamented, all lines meeting at right angles, everything gray in color. Dreary, mouthed Doors, so dreary. Egalitarian, whispered Selden. I suspect no brother can lay claim to precedence of any obvious kind over any other. There were many pedestrians on the walkways as they passed. There were no signs of any moving corridors, and no sound of any nearby expressway. Doris said, I'm guessing the greys are women. It's hard to tell, said Selden. The gowns hide everything, and one hairless head is like another. The greys are always in pairs, or with a white. The whites can walk alone, and Sunmaster is a white. You may be right. Selden raised his voice. Sunmaster, I am curious. If you are, then ask what you wish, although I am by no means required to answer. We seem to be passing through a residential area. There are no signs of business establishments, industrial areas. 
We are a farming community entirely. Where are you from that you do not know this? You know I am an outworlder, Selden said stiffly. I have been on Trantor for only two months. Even so. But if you are a farming community, Sunmaster, how is it that we have passed no farms either? On lower levels, said Sunmaster briefly. Is mycogen on this level entirely residential, then? And on a few others. We are what you see. Every brother and his family lives in equivalent quarters, every cohort in its own equivalent community. All have the same ground cars, and all brothers drive their own. There are no servants, and none are at ease through the labor of others. None may glory over another. Selden lifted his shielded eyebrows at doors and said, But some of the people wear white, while some wear gray. That is because some of the people are brothers, and some are sisters. And we? You are a tribesman and a guest. You and your... He paused and then said, Companion will not be bound by all aspects of Mycogenian life. Nevertheless, you will wear a white gown, and your companion will wear a gray one, and you will live in special guest quarters like our own. Equality for all seems a pleasant ideal, but what happens as your numbers increase? Is the pie then cut into smaller pieces? There is no increase in numbers. That would necessitate an increase in area which the surrounding tribesmen would not allow, or a change for the worse in our way of life. But if... began Selden. Sunmaster cut him off. It is enough, tribesman Selden. As I warned you, I am not compelled to answer. Our task, which we have promised our friend tribesman Hummin, is to keep you secure as long as you do not violate our way of life. That we will do, but there it ends. Curiosity is permitted, but it wears out our patience quickly if persisted in. Something about his tone allowed no more to be said, and Selden chafed. Hummin, for all his help, had clearly misstressed the matter. It was not security that Selden sought, at least not security alone. He needed information, too, and without that he could not and would not stay here. 38. Selden looked with some distress at their quarters. It had a small but individual kitchen and a small but individual bathroom. There were two narrow beds, two clothes closets, a table, and two chairs. In short, there was everything that was necessary for two people who were willing to live under cramped conditions. We had an individual kitchen and bathroom at Sinna, said Doris with an air of resignation. Not I, said Selden. Helicon may be a small world, but I lived in a modern city. Community kitchens and bathrooms. What a waste this is! You might expect it in a hotel, where one is compelled to make a temporary stay. But if the whole sector is like this, imagine the enormous number and duplications of kitchens and bathrooms. Part of the egalitarianism, I suppose, said Doors. No fighting for favored stalls or for faster service. The same for everyone. No privacy, either. Not that I mind terribly, Doors, but you might, and I don't want to give the appearance of taking advantage. We ought to make it clear to them that we must have separate rooms, adjoining but separate. Doris said, I'm sure it won't work. Space is at a premium, and I think they are amazed by their own generosity in giving us this much. We'll just make do, Harry. We're each old enough to manage. I'm not a blushing maiden, and you'll never convince me that you're a callow youth. 
You wouldn't be here were it not for me. What of it? It's an adventure. All right, then. Which bed will you take? Why don't you take the one nearer the bathroom? He sat down on the other. There's something else that bothers me. As long as we're here, we're tribespeople, you and I, as is even Humman. We're of the other tribes, not their own cohorts, and most things are none of our business. But most things are my business. That's what I've come here for. I want to know some of the things they know. Or think they know, said Doris with the historian's skepticism. I understand they have legends that are supposed to date back to primordial times, but I can't believe they can be taken seriously. We can't know that until we find out what those legends are. Are there no outside records of them? Not that I know of. These people are terribly ingrown. They're almost psychotic in their inward clinging. That Humman can break down their barriers somewhat and even get them to take us in is remarkable, really remarkable. Selden brooded. There has to be an opening somewhere. Sunmaster was surprised, angry in fact, that I didn't know Mycogen was an agricultural community. That seems to be something they don't want kept a secret. The point is, it isn't a secret. Mycogen is supposed to be from archaic words meaning yeast producer. At least, that's what I've been told. I'm not a paleolinguist. In any case, they culture all varieties of microfood. Yeast, of course, along with algae, bacteria, multicellular fungi, and so on. That's not uncommon, said Selden. Most worlds have this microculture. We have some even on Helicon. Not like mycogen. It's their specialty. They use methods as archaic as the name of their section. Secret fertilizing formulas, secret environmental influences. Who knows what? All is secret. Ingrown. With a vengeance. What it amounts to is that they produce protein and subtle flavoring so that their microfood isn't like any other in the world. They keep the volume comparatively low, and the price is sky high. I've never tasted any, and I'm sure you haven't, but it sells in great quantities to the imperial bureaucracy and to the upper classes on other worlds. Mycogen depends on such sales for its economic health so they want everyone to know that they are the source of this valuable food. That, at least, is no secret. Mycogen must be rich, then. They're not poor, but I suspect that it's not wealth they're after. It's protection. The imperial government protects them, because without them there wouldn't be these microfoods that add the subtlest flavors, the tangiest spices to every dish. That means that mycogen can maintain its odd way of life and be haughty toward its neighbors, who probably find them insupportable. Doris looked about. They live an austere life. There's no holovision, I notice, and no book films. I noticed one in the closet up on the shelf. Selden reached for it, stared at the label, and then said in clear disgust, a cookbook. Doris held out her hand for it and manipulated the keys. It took a while, for the arrangement was not quite orthodox, but she finally managed to light the screen and inspect the pages. She said, There are a few recipes, but for the most part this seems to consist of philosophical essays on gastronomy. She shut it off and turned it round and about. It seems to be a single unit. I don't see how one would eject the microcard and insert another. A one-book scanner. <laughs> now that's a waste. Maybe they think this one-book film is all anyone needs. He reached toward the end table that was between the two beds and picked up another object. 
This could be a speaker, except that there's no screen. Perhaps they consider the voice sufficient. How does it work, I wonder? Selden lifted it and looked at it from different sides. Did you ever see anything like this? In a museum once, if this is the same thing, mycogen seems to keep itself deliberately archaic. I suppose they consider that another way of separating themselves from the so-called tribesmen that surround them in overwhelming numbers. Their archaism and odd customs make them indigestible, so to speak. There's a kind of perverse logic to all that. Selden, still playing with the device, said, Whoops, it went on. Or something went on, but I don't hear anything. Doors frowned and picked up a small felt-lined cylinder that remained behind on the end table. She put it to her ear. There's a voice coming out of this, she said. Here, try it. She handed it to him. Zeldin did so and said, Ouch! It clips on. He listened and said, Yes, it hurt my ear. You can hear me, I take it. Yes, this is our room. No, I don't know its number. Doris, have you any idea of the number? Doris said, There's a number on the speaker. Maybe that will do. Maybe, said Selden doubtfully. Then he said into the speaker, The number on this device is 6LT-3648A. Will that do? Well, where do I find out how to use this device properly, and how to use the kitchen for that matter? What do you mean it all works the usual way? That doesn't do me any good. See here, I'm a... a tribesman, an honored guest. I don't know the usual way. Yes, I'm sorry about my accent, and I'm glad you can recognize a tribesman when you hear one. My name is Harry Selden. There was a pause, and Selden looked up at Doors with a long-suffering expression on his face. He has to look me up, and I suppose he'll tell me he can't find me. Oh, you have me? Good. In that case, can you give me the information? Yes. 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 And how can I call someone outside Mycogen? Oh, then what about contacting Sunmaster 14, for instance? Well, his assistant, then, his aide, whatever. Uh-huh. Thank you. He put the speaker down, unhooked the hearing device from his ear with a little difficulty, turned the whole thing off, and said, They'll arrange to have someone show us anything we need to know, but he can't promise when that might be. You can't call outside Mycogen, not on this thing anyway, so we couldn't get Hummin if we needed him. And if I want Sunmaster 14, I've got to go through a tremendous rigmarole. This may be an egalitarian society, but there seem to be exceptions that I bet no one will openly admit. He looked at his watch. In any case, Doors, I'm not going to view a cookbook, and still less am I going to view learned essays. My watch is still telling university time, so I don't know if it's officially bedtime, and at the moment I don't care. We've been awake most of the night, and I would like to sleep. That's all right with me. I'm tired, too. Thanks. And whenever a new day starts after we've caught up on our sleep, I'm going to ask for a tour of their microfood plantations. Doris looked startled. Are you interested? Not really. But if that's the one thing they're proud of, they should be willing to talk about it. And once I get them into a talking mood, then by exerting all my charm I may get them to talk about their legends, too. 
Personally, I think that's a clever strategy. I hope so, said Doris dubiously. But I think that the Mycogenians will not be so easily trapped. We'll see, said Selden grimly. I mean to get those legends. 39. The next morning found Harry using the calling device again. He was angry, because for one thing, he was hungry. His attempt to reach Sunmaster 14 was deflected by someone who insisted that Sunmaster could not be disturbed. Why not? Selden had asked waspishly. Obviously, there is no need to answer that question, came back a cold voice. We were not brought here to be prisoners, said Selden with equal coldness, nor to starve. I'm sure you have a kitchen and ample supplies of food. Yes, we do, said Selden, and I do not know how to use the kitchen devices, nor do I know how to prepare the food. Do you eat it raw, fry it? Boil it, roast it. I can't believe you are ignorant in such matters. Doors, who had been pacing up and down during this colloquy, reached for the device, and Selden fended her off, whispering, He'll break the connection if a woman tries to speak to him. Then, into the device, he said more firmly than ever, what you believe or don't believe doesn't matter to me in the least. You send someone here, someone who can do something about our situation, or when I reach Sunmaster 14, as I will eventually, you will pay for this. Nevertheless, it was two hours before someone arrived, by which time Selden was in a state of savagery, and Doors had grown rather desperate in her attempt to soothe him. The newcomer was a young man whose bald pate was slightly freckled and who probably would have been a redhead otherwise. He was bearing several pots, and he seemed about to explain them when he suddenly looked uneasy and turned his back on Selden in alarm. Dreisman, he said, obviously agitated, your skin cap is not well adjusted. Selden, whose impatience had reached the breaking point, said, That doesn't bother me. Doris, however, said, Let me adjust it, Harry. It's just a bit too high here on the left side. Selden then growled, You can turn now, young man. What is your name? I am Grey Cloud Five, said the Mycogenian uncertainly as he turned and looked cautiously at Selden. I am a novitiate. I have brought a meal for you. He hesitated. From my own kitchen, where my woman prepared it, tribesman. He put the pots down on the table, and Selden raised one lid and sniffed the contents suspiciously. He looked up at Doris in surprise. You know, it doesn't smell bad. Doris nodded. You're right. I can smell it, too. Grey Cloud said, It's not as hot as it ought to be. It cooled off in transport. You must have crockery and cutlery in your kitchen. Doors got what was needed, and after they had eaten, largely and a bit greedily, Selden felt civilized once more. Doors, who realized that the young man would feel unhappy at being alone with a woman, and even unhappier if she spoke to him, found that, by default, it fell to her to carry the pots and dishes into the kitchen and wash them, once she deciphered the controls of the washing device. Meanwhile, Selden asked the local time and said, somewhat abashed, You mean it's the middle of the night? Indeed, tribesman, said Greycloud. That's why it took a while to satisfy your need. Selden understood suddenly why Sunmaster could not be disturbed, and thought of Grey Cloud's woman having to be awakened to prepare him a meal, and felt his conscience gnaw at him. I'm sorry, he said. We are only tribespeople, and we didn't know how to use the kitchen or how to prepare the food. 
In the morning, could you have someone arrive to instruct us properly? The best I can do, tribesman, said Grey Cloud placatingly, is to have two sisters sent in. I ask your pardon for inconveniencing you with feminine presence, but it is they who know these things. Doors, who had emerged from the kitchen, said, before remembering her place in the masculine Mycogenian society, That's fine, Grey Cloud. We'd love to meet the sisters. Grey Cloud looked at her uneasily and fleetingly, but said nothing. Selden, convinced that the young Mycogenian would, on principle, refuse to have heard what a woman said to him, repeated the remark. That's fine, Grey Cloud. We'd love to meet the sisters. His expression cleared at once. I will have them here as soon as it is day. When Grey Cloud had left, Selden said with some satisfaction, The sisters are likely to be exactly what we need. Indeed? And in what way, Harry? asked Doors. Well, surely if we treat them as though they are human beings, they will be grateful enough to speak of their legends. If they know them, said Doris skeptically. Somehow I have no faith that the Mycogenians bother to educate their women very well. 40. The sisters arrived some six hours later, after Selden and Doris had slept some more, hoping to readjust their biological clocks. The sisters entered the apartment shyly, almost on tiptoe. Their gowns, which it turned out were termed kirtles in the Mycogenian dialect, were soft, velvety gray, each uniquely decorated by a subtle pattern of fine, darker gray webbing. The kirtles were not entirely unattractive, but they were certainly most efficient at covering up any human feature. And, of course, their heads were bald, and their faces were devoid of any ornamentation. They darted speculative glances at the touch of blue at the corners of Dora's eyes and at the slight red stain at the corners of her lips. For a few moments, Selden wondered how one could be certain that the sisters were truly sisters. The answer came at once, with the sisters' politely formal greetings. Both twittered and chirped. Selden, remembering the grave tones of Sunmaster, and the nervous baritone of Grey Cloud, suspected that women, in default of obvious sexual identification, were forced to cultivate distinctive voices and social mannerisms. I'm Raindrop 43, twittered one, and this is my younger sister. Raindrop 45, chirped the other. We're very strong on raindrops in our cohort, she giggled. I am pleased to meet you both, said Doris gravely. But now I must know how to address you. I can't just say Raindrop, can I? No, said Raindrop 43. You must use the full name if we are both here. Selden said, How about just 43 and 45, ladies? They both stole a quick glance at him, but said not a word. Doris said softly, I'll deal with them, Harry. Selden stepped back. Presumably they were single young women, and very likely they were not supposed to speak to men. The older one seemed the graver of the two, and was perhaps the more puritanical. It was hard to tell from a few words and a quick glance, but he had the feeling, and was willing to go by that. Doris said, the thing is, sisters, that we tribespeople don't know how to use the kitchen. You mean you can't cook? Raindrop 43 looked shocked and censorious. Raindrop 45 smothered a laugh. Selden decided that his initial estimate of the two was correct. Doris said, I once had a kitchen of my own, but it wasn't like this one, and I don't know what the foods are or how to prepare them. It's really quite simple, 
said Raindrop 45. We can show you. We'll make you a good nourishing lunch, said Raindrop 43. We'll make it for both of you. She hesitated before adding the final words. It clearly took an effort to acknowledge the existence of a man. If you don't mind, said Doors, I would like to be in the kitchen with you, and I would appreciate it if you'd explain everything exactly. After all, sisters, I can't expect you to come here three times a day to cook for us. We will show you everything, said Raindrop 43, nodding her head stiffly. It may be difficult for a tribeswoman to learn, however. You wouldn't have the feeling for it. I shall try, said Doris with a pleasant smile. They disappeared into the kitchen. Selden stared after them and tried to work out the strategy he intended to use. Microfarm Mycogen. The microfarms of mycogen are legendary, though they survive today only in such oft-used similes as rich as the microfarms of mycogen or tasty as mycogenian yeast. Such encomiums tend to intensify with time, to be sure, but Harry Selden visited those microfarms in the course of the flight, and there are references in his memoirs that would tend to support the popular opinion. Encyclopedia Galactica 41. That was good, said Selden explosively. It was considerably better than the food Grey Cloud brought. Doris said reasonably, You have to remember that Grey Cloud's woman had to prepare it on short notice in the middle of the night. She paused and said, I wish they would say wife. They make woman sound like such an appanage, like my house or my robe. It is absolutely demeaning. I know. It's infuriating. But they might well make wife sound like an appanage as well. It's the way they live, and the sisters don't seem to mind. You and I aren't going to change it by lecturing. Anyway, did you see how the sisters did it? Yes, I did, and they made everything seem very simple. I doubted I could remember everything they did, but they insisted I wouldn't have to. I could get away with mere heating. I gathered the bread had some sort of microderivative added to it in the baking that both raised the dough and lent it that crunchy consistency and warm flavor. Just a hint of pepper, didn't you think? I couldn't tell, but whatever it was, I didn't get enough. And the soup. Did you recognize any of the vegetables? No. And what was the sliced meat, could you tell? I don't think it was sliced meat, actually. We did have a lamb dish back on Cinna that it reminded me of. It was certainly not lamb. I said that I doubted it was meat at all. I don't think anyone outside mycogen eats like this either. Not even the emperor, I'm sure. Whatever the mycogenians sell is, I'm willing to bet, near the bottom of the line. They save the best for themselves. We had better not stay here too long, Harry. If we get used to eating like this, we'll never be able to acclimatize ourselves to the miserable stuff they have outside. She laughed. Selden laughed, too. He took another sip at the fruit juice, which tasted far more tantalizing than any fruit juice he had ever sipped before, and said, Listen, when Haman took me to the university, we stopped at a roadside diner and had some food that was heavily yeasted. It tasted like, now well, never mind what it tasted like, but I wouldn't have thought it conceivable then that microfood could taste like this. I wish the sisters were still here. It would have been polite to thank them. I think they were quite aware of how we would feel. I remarked on the wonderful smell while everything was warming, 
and they said quite complacently that it would taste even better. The older one said that, I imagine. Yes, the younger one giggled. And they'll be back. They're going to bring me a kirtle so that I can go out to see the shops with them. And they made it clear I would have to wash my face if I was to be seen in public. They will show me where to buy some good quality kirtles of my own, and where I can buy ready-made meals of all kinds. All I'll have to do is heat them up. They explained that decent sisters wouldn't do that, but would start from scratch. In fact, some of the meal they prepared for us was simply heated, and they apologized for that. They managed to imply, though, that tribespeople couldn't be expected to appreciate true artistry in cooking, so that simply heating prepared food would do for us. They seemed to take it for granted, by the way, that I will be doing all the shopping and cooking. As we say at home, when in Trantor, do as the Trantorians do. Yes, I was sure that would be your attitude in this case. I'm only human, said Selden. The usual excuse, said Doris with a small smile. Selden leaned back with a satisfactory, well-filled feeling and said, You've been on Trantor for two years, Doris, so you might understand a few things that I don't. Is it your opinion that this odd social system the Mycogenians have is part of a supernaturalistic view they have? Supernaturalistic? Yes. Would you have heard that this was so? What do you mean by supernaturalistic? The obvious. A belief in entities that are independent of natural law, that are not bound by the conservation of energy, for instance, or by the existence of a constant of action. I see. You're asking if Mycogen is a religious community. It was Selden's turn. Religious? Yes, it's an archaic term, but we historians use it. Our study is riddled with archaic terms. Religious is not precisely equivalent to supernaturalistic, though it contains richly supernaturalistic elements. I can't answer your specific question, however, because I've never made any special investigation of mycogen. Still, from what little I've seen of the place, and from my knowledge of religions in history, I wouldn't be surprised if the Mycogenian society was religious in character. In that case, would it surprise you if Mycogenian legends were also religious in character? No, it wouldn't and therefore not based on historical matter. That wouldn't necessarily follow. The core of the legends might still be authentically historic, allowing for distortion and supernaturalistic intermixture. Ah, said Selden, and seemed to retire into his thoughts. Finally, Doris broke the silence that followed and said, it's not so uncommon, you know. There is a considerable religious element on many worlds. It's grown stronger in the last few centuries as the empire has grown more turbulent. On my world of Sinna, at least a quarter of the population is tritheistic. Selden was again painfully and regretfully conscious of his ignorance of history. He said, Were there times in past history when religion was more prominent than it is today? Certainly. In addition, there are new varieties springing up constantly. The Mycogenian religion, whatever it might be, could be relatively new and may be restricted to Mycogen itself. I couldn't really tell without considerable study. But now we get to the point of it, Doors. Is it your opinion that women are more apt to be religious than men are? Doris Vanaboli raised her eyebrows. I'm not sure if we can assume anything as simple as that. She thought a bit. 
I suspect that those elements of a population that have a smaller stake in the material natural world are more apt to find solace in what you call supernaturalism. The poor, the disinherited, the downtrodden. Insofar as supernaturalism overlaps religion, they may also be more religious. There are obviously many exceptions in both directions. Many of the downtrodden may lack religion. Many of the rich, powerful, and satisfied may possess it. But in Mycogen, said Selden, where the women seem to be treated as subhuman, would I be right in assuming they would be more religious than the men, more involved in the legends that the society has been preserving? I wouldn't risk my life on it, Harry, but I'd be willing to risk a week's income on it. Good, said Selden thoughtfully. Doris smiled at him. There's a bit of your psychohistory, Harry. Rule number 47,854. The downtrodden are more religious than the satisfied. Selden shook his head. Don't joke about psychohistory, Doors. You know I'm not looking for tiny rules, but for vast generalizations and for means of manipulation. I don't want comparative religiosity as the result of a hundred specific rules. I want something from which I can, after manipulation through some system of mathematicized logic, say, Aha! This group of people will tend to be more religious than that group, provided that the following criteria are met, and that therefore, when humanity meets with these stimuli, it'll react with these responses. How horrible, said Doris. You are picturing human beings as simple mechanical devices. Press this button and you will get that twitch. No, because there will be many buttons pushing simultaneously to various degrees and eliciting so many responses of different sorts that overall the predictions of the future will be statistical in nature so that the individual human being will remain a free agent. How can you know this? I can't, said Selden. At least I don't know it. I feel it to be so. It is what I consider to be the way things ought to be. If I can find the axioms, the fundamental laws of humanics, so to speak, and the necessary mathematical treatment, then I will have my psychohistory. I have proved that in theory this is possible. But impractical, right? I keep saying so. A small smile curved Dora's lips. Is that what you are doing, Harry? Looking for some sort of solution to this problem? I don't know. I swear to you, I don't know. But Cheddar Humman is so anxious to find a solution, and for some reason I am anxious to please him. He is so persuasive a man. Yes, I know. Selden let that comment pass, although a small frown flitted across his face. Selden continued, Humman insists the empire is decaying, that it will collapse, that psychohistory is the only hope for saving it, or cushioning it, or ameliorating it, and that without it humanity will be destroyed, or at the very least go through prolonged misery. He seems to place the responsibility for preventing that on me. Now, the Empire will certainly last my time, but if I'm to live at ease, I must lift that responsibility from my shoulders. I must convince myself, and even convince Humman, that psychohistory is not a practical way out. That, despite theory, it cannot be developed. So I must follow up as many leads as I can and show that each one must fail. Leads? Like going back in history to a time when human society was smaller than it is now? Much smaller and far less complex. And showing that a solution is still impractical? Yes. But who is going to describe the early world for you? 
If the Mycogenians have some coherent picture of the primordial galaxy, Sunmaster certainly won't reveal it to a tribesman. No Mycogenian will. This is an ingrown society. How many times have we already said it? And its members are suspicious of tribesmen to the point of paranoia. They'll tell us nothing. I will have to think of a way to persuade some Mycogenians to talk. Those sisters, for instance. They won't even hear you, male that you are, any more than Sunmaster hears me. And even if they do talk to you, what would they know but a few catchphrases? I must start somewhere, Doris said. Well, let me think. Humman says I must protect you, and I interpret that as meaning I must help you when I can. What do I know about religion? That's nowhere near my specialty, you know. I have always dealt with economic forces rather than philosophic forces. But you can't split history into neat little non-overlapping divisions. For instance, religions tend to accumulate wealth when successful, and that eventually tends to distort the economic development of a society. There, incidentally, is one of the numerous rules of human history that you'll have to derive from your basic laws of humanics, or whatever you call them. But... And here, Dora's voice faded away as she lapsed into thought. Selden watched her cautiously, and Dora's eyes glazed as though she was looking deep within herself. Finally, she said, This is not an invariable rule, but it seems to me that on many occasions a religion has a book, or books, of significance. Books that give their ritual their view of history, their sacred poetry, and who knows what else. Usually those books are open to all and are a means of proselytization. Sometimes they're secret. Do you think Mycogen has books of that sort? To be truthful, said Doris thoughtfully, I have never heard of any. I might have if they existed openly, which means they either don't exist or are kept secret. In either case, it seems to me you are not going to see them. At least it's a starting point, said Selden grimly. Forty-two. The sisters returned about two hours after Harry and Doors had finished lunch. They were smiling, both of them, and Raindrop 43, the graver one, held up a gray kirtle for Dora's inspection. It is very attractive, said Dora's, smiling widely and nodding her head with a certain sincerity. I like the clever embroidery here. It is nothing, twittered Raindrop 45. It is one of my old things, and it won't fit very well, for you are taller than I am. But it will do for a while, and we will take you out to the very best curtlery to get a few that will fit you and your tastes perfectly. You will see. Raindrop 43, smiling a little nervously, but saying nothing and keeping her eyes fixed on the ground, handed a white kirtle to Doris. It was folded neatly. Doris did not attempt to unfold it, but passed it on to Selden. From the color, I should say it's yours, Harry. Presumably, said Selden. But give it back. She did not give it to me. Oh, Harry, mouthed Doris, shaking her head slightly. No, said Selden firmly. She did not give it to me. Give it back to her, and I'll wait for her to give it to me. Doris hesitated, then made a half-hearted attempt to pass the kirtle back to Raindrop 43. The sister put her hands behind her back and moved away, all life seeming to drain from her face. Raindrop 45 stole a glance at Selden, a very quick one, then took a quick step toward Raindrop 43, 
and put her arms about her. Doris said, Come, Harry, I'm sure that sisters are not permitted to talk to men who are not related to them. What's the use of making her miserable? She can't help it. I don't believe it, said Selden harshly. If there is such a rule, it applies only to brothers. I doubt very much that she's ever met a tribesman before. Doris said to Raindrop 43 in a soft voice, Have you ever met a tribesman before, sister, or a tribeswoman? A long hesitation, and then a slow negative shake of the head. Selden threw out his arms. Well, there you are. If there is a rule of silence, it applies only to the brothers. Would they have sent these young women, these sisters, to deal with us if there was any rule against speaking to tribesmen? It might be, Harry, that they were meant to speak only to me and I to you. Nonsense. I don't believe it, and I won't believe it. I am not merely a tribesman. I am an honored guest in Mycogen, asked to be treated as such by Cheddar Humman, and escorted here by Sun Master Fourteen himself. I will not be treated as though I do not exist. I will be in communication with Sun Master Fourteen, and I will complain bitterly. Raindrop Forty Five began to sob, and Raindrop Forty Three, retaining her comparative impassivity, nevertheless flushed faintly. Doris made as though to appeal to Selden once again, but he stopped her with a brief and angry outward thrust of his right arm, and then stared loweringly at Raindrop 43. And finally she spoke and did not twitter. Rather, her voice trembled hoarsely, as though she had to force it to sound in the direction of a male being, and was doing so against all her instincts and desires. You must not complain of us tribesmen. That would be unjust. You force me to break the custom of our people. What do you want of me? Selden smiled disarmingly at once and held out his hand. The garment you brought me. The kirtle. Silently, she stretched out her arm and deposited the kirtle in his hand. He bowed slightly and said in a soft, warm voice, Thank you, sister. He then cast a very brief look in Dora's direction as though to say, You see? But Dora's looked away angrily. The kirtle was featureless, Selden saw as he unfolded it. Embroidery and decorativeness were for women, apparently. But it came with a tasseled belt that probably had some particular way of being worn. No doubt he could work it out. He said, I'll step into the bathroom and put this thing on. It won't take but a minute, I suppose. He stepped into the small chamber and found the door would not close behind him, because Doris was forcing her way in as well. Only when the two of them were in the bathroom together did the door close. What were you doing? Doris hissed angrily. You were an absolute brute, Harry. Why did you treat the poor woman that way? Selden said impatiently, I had to make her talk to me. I'm counting on her for information. You know that. I'm sorry I had to be cruel, but how else could I have broken down her inhibitions? And he motioned her out. When he emerged, he found Doris in her kirtle, too. Doris, despite the bald head the skin cap gave her and the inherent dowdiness of the kirtle, managed to look quite attractive. The stitching on the robe somehow suggested a figure without revealing it in the least. Her belt was wider than his own, and was a slightly different shade of gray from her kirtle. What's more, it was held in front by two glittering blue stone snaps. Women did manage to beautify themselves even under the greatest difficulty, Selden thought. 
Looking over at Harry, Doris said, You look quite the Mycogenian now. The two of us are fit to be taken to the stores by the sisters. Yes, said Selden. But afterward, I want Raindrop 43 to take me on a tour of the microfarms. Raindrop 43's eyes widened, and she took a rapid step backward. I'd like to see them, said Selden calmly. Raindrop 43 looked quickly at Doors. Tribeswoman, Selden said, Perhaps you know nothing of the farm, sister. That seemed to touch a nerve. She lifted her chin haughtily as she still carefully addressed Doors. I have worked on the microfarms. All brothers and sisters do at some point in their lives. Well then, take me on the tour, said Selden, and let's not go through the argument again. I am not a brother to whom you are forbidden to speak and with whom you may have no dealings. I am a tribesman and an honored guest. I wear this skin cap and this kirtle so as not to attract undue attention, but I am a scholar, and while I am here I must learn. I cannot sit in this room and stare at the wall. I want to see the one thing you have that the rest of the galaxy does not have, your microfarms. I should think you'd be proud to show them. We are proud, said Raindrop 43, finally facing Selden as she spoke. And I will show you, and don't think you will learn any of our secrets, if that's what you are after. I will show you the microfarms tomorrow morning. It will take time to arrange a tour. Selden said, I will wait till tomorrow morning. But do you promise? Do I have your word of honor? Raindrop 43 said with clear contempt, I am a sister, and I will do as I say. I will keep my word, even to a tribesman. Her voice grew icy at the last words, while her eyes widened and seemed to glitter. Selden wondered what was passing through her mind and felt uneasy. 43. Selden passed a restless night. To begin with, Doors had announced that she must accompany him on the tour of the microfarm, and he had objected strenuously. The whole purpose, he said, is to make her talk freely, to present her with an unusual environment, alone with a male, even if a tribesman. Having broken customs so far, it will be easier to break it further. If you're along, she will talk to you, and I will only get the leavings. And if something happens to you in my absence, as it did Upperside? Nothing will happen. Please, if you want to help me, stay away. If not, I will have nothing further to do with you. I mean it, Doris. This is important to me. Much as I've grown fond of you, you cannot come ahead of this. She agreed with enormous reluctance, and said only, Promise me you'll at least be nice to her then. And Selden said, Is it me you must protect, or her? I assure you that I didn't treat her harshly for pleasure, and I won't do so in the future. The memory of this argument with Doors, their first, helped keep him awake a large part of the night. That, together with the nagging thought that the two sisters might not arrive in the morning, despite Raindrop 43's promise. They did arrive, however, not long after Selden had completed a spare breakfast. He was determined not to grow fat through overindulgence, and had put on a kirtle that fitted him precisely. He had carefully organized the belt so that it hung perfectly. Raindrop 43, still with a touch of ice in her eye, said, If you are ready, tribesman Selden, my sister will remain with tribeswoman Venabili. Her voice was neither twittery nor hoarse. It was as though she had steadied herself through the night, 
practicing in her mind how to speak to one who was a male, but not a brother. Selden wondered if she had lost sleep, and said, I am quite ready. Together, half an hour later, Raindrop 43 and Harry Selden were descending level upon level. Though it was daytime by the clock, the light was dusky and dimmer than it had been elsewhere on Trantor. There was no obvious reason for this. Surely the artificial daylight that slowly progressed around the Trantorian sphere could include the Mycogen sector. The Mycogenians must want it that way, Selden thought, clinging to some primitive habit. Slowly, Selden's eyes adjusted to the dim surroundings. Selden tried to meet the eyes of passers-by, whether brothers or sisters, calmly. He assumed he and Raindrop 43 would be taken as a brother and his woman, and that they would be given no notice as long as he did nothing to attract attention. Unfortunately, it seemed as if Raindrop 43 wanted to be noticed. She talked to him in few words and in low tones out of a clenched mouth. It was clear that the company of an unauthorized male, even though only she knew this fact, ravaged her self-confidence. Selden was quite sure that if he asked her to relax, he would merely make her that much more uneasy. Selden wondered what she would do if she met someone who knew her. He felt more relaxed once they reached the lower levels, where human beings were fewer. The descent was not by elevators either, but by moving stared ramps that existed in pairs, one going up and one going down. Raindrop 43 referred to them as escalators. Selden wasn't sure he had caught the word correctly, never having heard it before. As they sank to lower and lower levels, Selden's apprehension grew. Most worlds possessed microfarms, and most worlds produced their own varieties of microproducts. Selden, back on Helicon, had occasionally shopped for seasonings in the microfarms, and was always aware of an unpleasant stomach-turning stench. The people who worked at the microfarms didn't seem to mind. Even when casual visitors wrinkled their noses, they seemed to acclimate themselves to it. Selden, however, was always peculiarly susceptible to the smell. He suffered, and he expected to suffer now. He tried soothing himself with the thought that he was nobly sacrificing his comfort to his need for information, but that didn't keep his stomach from turning itself into knots in apprehension. After he had lost track of the number of levels they had descended, with the air still seeming reasonably fresh, he asked, When do we get to the microfarm levels? We're there now. Selden breathed deeply. It doesn't smell as though we are. Smell? What do you mean? Raindrop 43 was offended enough to speak quite loudly. There was always a putrid odor associated with microfarms in my experience. You know, from the fertilizer that bacteria, yeast, fungi, and saprophytes generally need. In your experience? Her voice lowered again. Where was that? On my home world. The sister twisted her face into wild repugnance. And your people wallow in gabelle? Selden had never heard the word before, but from the look and the intonation, he knew what it meant. He said, It doesn't smell like that, you understand, once it is ready for consumption. Ours doesn't smell like that at any time. Our biotechnicians have worked out perfect strains. The algae grow in the purest light and the most carefully balanced electrolyte solutions. The saprophytes are fed on beautifully combined organics. The formulas and recipes are something no tribespeople will ever know. Come on, here we are. Sniff all you want. You'll find nothing offensive. That is one reason why our food is in demand throughout the galaxy, and why the Emperor, we are told, 
eats nothing else. Though it is far too good for a tribesman, if you ask me, even if he calls himself emperor. She said it with an anger that seemed directly aimed at Selden. Then, as though afraid he might miss that, she added, or even if he calls himself an honored guest. They stepped out into a narrow corridor, on each side of which were large, thick glass tanks, in which roiled cloudy green water, full of swirling, growing algae, moving about through the force of the gas bubbles that streamed up through it. They would be rich in carbon dioxide, he decided. Rich, rosy light shone down into the tanks, light that was much brighter than that in the corridors. He commented thoughtfully on that. Of course, she said. These algae work best at the red end of the spectrum. I presume, said Selden, that everything is automated. She shrugged, but did not respond. I don't see quantities of brothers and sisters in evidence. Selden said, persisting. Nevertheless, there is work to be done, and they do it, even if you don't see them at work. The details are not for you. Don't waste your time by asking about it. Wait. Don't be angry with me. I don't expect to be told state secrets. Come on, dear. The word slipped out. He took her arm as she seemed on the point of hurrying away. She remained in place, but he felt her shudder slightly, and he released her in embarrassment. He said, It's just that it seems automated. Make what you wish of the seeming. Nevertheless, there is room here for human brains and human judgment. Every brother and sister has occasion to work here at some time. Some make a profession of it. She was speaking more freely now, but to his continuing embarrassment, he noticed her left hand move stealthily toward her right arm and gently rub the spot where he had touched her, as though he had stung her. It goes on for kilometers and kilometers, she said. But if we turn here, there'll be a portion of the fungal section you can see. They moved along. Selden noted how clean everything was. The glass sparkled. The tiled floor seemed moist, though when he seized a moment to bend and touch it, it wasn't. Nor was it slippery. Unless his sandals, with his big toe protruding in approved Mycogenian fashion, had non-slip soles. Raindrop 43 was right in one respect. Here and there a brother or a sister worked silently studying gauges, adjusting controls, sometimes engaged in something as unskilled as polishing equipment, always absorbed in whatever they were doing. Selden was careful not to ask what they were doing, since he did not want to cause the sister humiliation in having to answer that she did not know, or anger in her having to remind him there were things he must not know. They passed through a lightly swinging door, and Selden suddenly noticed the faintest touch of the odor he remembered. He looked at Raindrop 43, but she seemed unconscious of it, and soon he too became used to it. The character of the light changed suddenly. The rosiness was gone, and the brightness too. All seemed to be in a twilight, except where equipment was spotlighted, and wherever there was a spotlight, there seemed to be a brother or a sister. Some wore lighted headbands that gleamed with a pearly glow, and in the middle distance, Selden could see, here and there, small sparks of light moving erratically. As they walked, he cast a quick eye on her profile. It was all he could really judge by. At all other times, he could not cease being conscious of her bulging bald head, her bare eyes, her colorless face. They drowned her individuality and seemed to make her invisible. Here in profile, however, he could see something. Nose, chin, full lips, regularity, beauty. 
The dim light somehow smoothed out and softened the great upper desert. He thought with surprise, she could be very beautiful if she grew her hair and arranged it nicely. And then he thought that she couldn't grow her hair. She would be bald her whole life. Why? Why did they have to do that to her? Sunmaster said it was so that a Mycogenian would know himself or herself for a Mycogenian all his or her life. Why was that so important that the curse of hairlessness had to be accepted as a badge or mark of identity? And then, because he was used to arguing both sides in his mind, he thought, Custom is second nature. Be accustomed to a bald head, sufficiently accustomed, and hair on it would seem monstrous, would evoke nausea. He himself had shaved his face every morning, removing all the facial hair, uncomfortable at the merest stubble. And yet he did not think of his face as bald, or as being in any way unnatural. Of course, he could grow his facial hair at any time he wished, but he didn't wish to do so. He knew that there were worlds on which the men did not shave. In some, they did not even clip or shape the facial hair, but let it grow wild. What would they say if they could see his own bald face, his own hairless chin, cheek, and lips? And meanwhile, he walked with Raindrop 43, endlessly, it seemed. And every once in a while, she guided him by the elbow and it seemed to him that she had grown accustomed to that, for she did not withdraw her hand hastily. Sometimes it remained for nearly a minute. She said, Here, come here. What is that? asked Selden. They were standing before a small tray filled with little spheres, each about two centimeters in diameter. A brother who was tending the area and who had just placed the tray where it was, looked up in mild inquiry. Raindrop 43 said to Selden in a low voice, Ask for a few. Selden realized she could not speak to a brother until spoken to, and said uncertainly, May we have a few, brother? Have a handful, brother, said the other heartily. Selden plucked out one of the spheres and was on the point of handing it to Raindrop 43 when he noticed that she had accepted the invitation as applying to herself and reached in for two handfuls. The sphere felt glossy, smooth. Selden said to Raindrop 43 as they moved away from the vat and from the brother who was in attendance, Are these supposed to be eaten? He lifted the sphere cautiously to his nose. They don't smell, she said sharply. What are they? Dainties, raw dainties. For the outside market, they're flavored in different ways. But here in Mycogen, we eat them unflavored, the only way. She put one in her mouth and said, I never have enough. Selden put his sphere into his mouth and felt it dissolve and disappear rapidly. His mouth for a moment ran liquid, and then it slid almost of its own accord down his throat. He stood for a moment, amazed. It was slightly sweet, and for that matter had an even fainter bitter aftertaste. But the main sensation eluded him. May I have another? he said. Have half a dozen, said Raindrop 43, holding out her hand. They never have quite the same taste twice, and have practically no calories. Just taste. She was right. He tried to have the dainty linger in his mouth. He tried licking it carefully, tried biting off a piece. However, the most careful lick destroyed it. When a bit was crunched off a piece, the rest of it disappeared at once. And each taste was undefinable, and not quite like the one before. The only trouble is, said the sister happily, 
that every once in a while you have a very unusual one, and you never forget it. But you never have it again, either. I had one when I was nine. Her expression suddenly lost its excitement, and she said, It's a good thing. It teaches you the evanescence of things in the world. It was a signal, Selden thought. They had wandered about aimlessly long enough. She had grown used to him and was talking to him, and now the conversation had to come to its point. Now. 44. Selden said, I come from a world which lies out in the open, sister, as all worlds do but Trentor. Rain comes or doesn't come. The rivers trickle or are in flood. Temperature is high or low. That means harvests are good or bad. Here, however, the environment is truly controlled. Harvests have no choice but to be good. How fortunate mycogen is. He waited. There were different possible answers, and his course of action would depend on which answer came. She was speaking quite freely now, and seemed to have no inhibitions concerning his masculinity, so this long tour had served its purpose. Raindrop 43 said, The environment is not that easy to control. There are, occasionally, viral infections, and there are sometimes unexpected and undesirable mutations. There are times when whole vast batches wither or are worthless. You astonish me. And what happens then? There is usually no recourse but to destroy the spoiled batches, even those that are merely suspected of spoilage. Trays and tanks must be totally sterilized, sometimes disposed of altogether. It amounts to surgery, then, said Selden. You cut out the diseased tissue. Yes. And what do you do to prevent such things from happening? What can we do? We test constantly for any mutations that may spring up, any new viruses that may appear, any accidental contamination or alteration of the environment. It rarely happens that we detect anything wrong, but if we do, we take drastic action. The result is that bad years are very few and even bad years affect only fractional bits here and there. The worst year we've ever had fell short of the average by only 12%, though that was enough to produce hardship. The trouble is that even the most careful forethought and the most cleverly designed computer programs can't always predict what is essentially unpredictable. Selden felt an involuntary shudder go through him. It was as though she was speaking of psychohistory, but she was only speaking of the microfarm produce of a tiny fraction of humanity, while he himself was considering all the mighty galactic empire in every one of all its activities. Unavoidably disheartened, he said, Surely it's not all unpredictable. There are forces that guide and that care for us all. The sister stiffened. She turned around toward him, seeming to study him with her penetrating eyes. But all she said was, What? Selden felt uneasy. It seems to me that in speaking of viruses and mutations, we're talking about the natural, about phenomena that are subject to natural law. That leaves out of account the supernatural, doesn't it? It leaves out that which is not subject to natural law, and can therefore control natural law. She continued to stare at him, as though he had suddenly begun speaking some distant, unknown dialect of galactic standard. Again she said, in half a whisper this time, What? He continued, stumbling over unfamiliar words that half embarrassed him. You must appeal to some great essence, some great spirit, some... I don't know what to call it. 
Raindrop 43 said in a voice that rose into higher registers, but remained low. I thought so. I thought that was what you meant, but I couldn't believe it. You're accusing us of having religion. Why didn't you say so? Why didn't you use the word? She waited for an answer, and Selden, a little confused at the onslaught, said, Because that's not a word I use. I call it supernaturalism. Call it what you will. It's religion, and we don't have it. Religion is for the tribesmen, for the swarming sc The sister paused to swallow, as though she had come near to choking, and Selden was certain the word she had choked over was scum. She was in control again. Speaking slowly and somewhat below her normal soprano, she said, We are not a religious people. Our kingdom is of this galaxy and always has been. If you have a religion... Selden felt trapped. Somehow he had not counted on this. He raised a hand defensively. Not really. I'm a mathematician, and my kingdom is also of this galaxy. It's just that I thought, from the rigidity of your customs, that your kingdom... Don't think it, tribesmen. If our customs are rigid, it is because we are mere millions surrounded by billions. Somehow we must mark ourselves off so that we precious few are not lost among your swarms and hordes. We must be marked off by our hairlessness, our clothing, our behavior, our way of life. We must know who we are, and we must be sure that you tribesmen know who we are. We labor in our farms so that we can make ourselves valuable in your eyes, and thus make certain that you leave us alone. That's all we ask of you, to leave us alone. I have no intention of harming you or any of your people. I seek only knowledge, here as everywhere. So you insult us by asking about our religion, as though we have ever called on a mysterious, insubstantial spirit to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. There are many people, many worlds, who believe in supernaturalism in one form or another. Religion, if you like the word better. We may disagree with them in one way or another, but we are as likely to be wrong in our disbelief as they in their belief. In any case, there is no disgrace in such belief, and my questions were not intended as insults. But she was not reconciled. Religion, she said angrily. We have no need of it. Selden's spirits, having sunk steadily in the course of this exchange, reached bottom. This whole thing, this expedition with Raindrop 43, had come to nothing. But she went on to say, We have something far better. We have history. And Selden's feelings rebounded at once, and he smiled. Book Hand on Thigh Story An occasion cited by Harry Selden as the first turning point in his search for a method to develop psychohistory. Unfortunately, his published writings give no indication as to what that story was, and speculations concerning it, there have been many, are futile. It remains one of the many intriguing mysteries concerning Selden's career. Encyclopedia Galactica. 45. Raindrop 43 stared at Selden, wild-eyed and breathing heavily. I can't stay here, she said. Selden looked about. No one is bothering us. Even the brother from whom we got the dainties said nothing about us. He seemed to take us as a perfectly normal pair. That's because there is nothing unusual about us. When the light is dim, 
when you keep your voice low so the tribesman accent is less noticeable, and when I seem calm. But now... Her voice was growing hoarse. What of now? I am nervous and tense. I am in a perspiration. Who is to notice? Relax, calm down. I can't relax here. I can't calm down while I may be noticed. Where are we to go, then? There are little sheds for resting. I have worked here. I know about them. She was walking rapidly now, and Selden followed. Up a small ramp, which she would not have noticed in the twilight without her, there was a line of doors, well spread apart. The one at the end, she muttered, if it's free. It was unoccupied. A small glowing rectangle said, not in use, and the door was ajar. Raindrop 43 looked about rapidly, motioned Selden in, then stepped inside herself. She closed the door, and as she did so, a small ceiling light brightened the interior. Selden said, Is there any way the sign on the door can indicate this shed is in use? That happened automatically when the door closed and the light went on, said the sister. Selden could feel air softly circulating with a small sighing sound. But where on Trantor was that ever-present sound and feel not apparent? The room was not large, but it had a cot with a firm, efficient mattress, and what were obviously clean sheets. There was a chair and table, a small refrigerator, and something that looked like an enclosed hot plate, probably a tiny food heater. Raindrop 43 sat down on the chair, sitting stiffly upright, visibly attempting to force herself into relaxation. Selden, uncertain as to what he ought to do, remained standing until she gestured, a bit impatiently, for him to sit on the cot. He did so. Raindrop 43 said softly as though talking to herself, if it is ever known that I have been here with a man, even if only a tribesman, I shall indeed be an outcast. Selden rose quickly. Then let's not stay here. Sit down. I can't go out when I'm in this mood. You've been asking about religion. What are you after? It seemed to Selden that she had changed completely. Gone was the passivity, the subservience. There was none of the shyness, the backwardness in the presence of a male. She was glaring at him through narrowed eyes. I told you. Knowledge. I'm a scholar. It is my profession and my desire to know. I want to understand people in particular, so I want to learn history. For many worlds, the ancient historical records... The truly ancient historical records have decayed into myths and legends, often becoming part of a set of religious beliefs or of supernaturalism. But if mycogen does not have a religion, then... I said we have history. Selden said, Twice you've said you have history. How old? It goes back twenty thousand years. Truly? Let us speak frankly. Is it real history, or is it something that has degenerated into legend? It is real history, of course. Selden was on the point of asking how she could tell, but thought better of it. Was there really a chance that history might reach back 20,000 years and be authentic? He was not a historian himself so he would have to check with doors. But it seems so likely to him that on every world the earliest histories were medleys of self-serving heroisms and mini-dramas that were meant as morality plays and were not to be taken literally. It was surely true of Helicon, 
Yet you would find scarcely a Heliconian who would not swear by all the tales told and insist it was all true history. They would support as such even that perfectly ridiculous tale of the first exploration of Helicon and the encounters with large and dangerous flying reptiles, even though nothing like flying reptiles had been found to be native to any world explored and settled by human beings. He said instead, How does this history begin? There was a faraway look in the sister's eyes, a look that did not focus on Selden or on anything in the room. She said, It begins with a world, our world, one world. One world. Selden remembered that Haman had spoken of legends of a single original world of humanity. One world. There were others later, but ours was the first. One world, with space, with open air, with room for everyone, with fertile fields, with friendly homes, with warm people. For thousands of years we lived there, and then we had to leave and skulk in one place or another until some of us found a corner of Trantor where we learned to grow food that brought us a little freedom. And here in Mycogen we now have our own ways and our own dreams. And your histories give the full details concerning the original world, the one world? Oh, yes, it is all in a book, and we all have it. Every one of us. We carry it at all times, so that there is never a moment when any one of us cannot open it and read it and remember who we are and who we were and resolve that someday we will have our world back. Do you know where this world is and who lives on it now? Raindrop 43 hesitated, then shook her head fiercely. We do not. But someday we will find it. And you have this book in your possession now? Of course. May I see that book? Now a slow smile crossed the face of the sister. She said, So that's what you want. I knew you wanted something when you asked to be guided through the microfarms by me alone. She seemed a little embarrassed. I didn't think it was the book. It is all I want, said Selden earnestly. I really did not have my mind on anything else. If you brought me here because you thought... She did not allow him to finish. But here we are. Do you or don't you want the book? Are you offering to let me see it? On one condition... Selden paused, weighing the possibility of serious trouble if he had overcome the sister's inhibitions to a greater extent than he had ever intended. What condition? he said. Raindrop 43's tongue emerged lightly and licked quickly at her lips. Then she said with a distinct tremor in her voice, That you remove your skin cap. 46. Harry Selden stared blankly at Raindrop 43. There was a perceptible moment in which he did not know what she was talking about. He had forgotten he was wearing a skin cap. Then he put his hand to his head, and for the first time consciously felt the skin cap he was wearing. It was smooth, but he felt the tiny resilience of the hair beneath. Not much. His hair, after all, was fine and without much body. He said, still feeling it, Why? She said, Because I want you to, because that's the condition if you want to see the book. He said, Well, if you really want me to. His hand probed for the edge so that he could peel it off. But she said, No. Let me do it. I'll do it. 
She was looking at him hungrily. Selden dropped his hands to his lap. Go ahead, then. The sister rose quickly and sat down next to him on the cot. Slowly, carefully, she detached the skin cap from his head just in front of his ear. Again she licked her lips, and she was panting as she loosened the skin cap about his forehead and turned it up. Then it came away and was gone, and Selden's hair, released, seemed to stir a bit in glad freedom. He said, troubled, Keeping my hair under the skin cap has probably made my scalp sweat. If so, my hair will be rather damp. He raised his hand as though to check the matter, but she caught it and held it back. I want to do that, she said. It's part of the condition. Her fingers slowly and hesitantly touched his hair and then withdrew. She touched it again, and very gently stroked it. It's dry, she said. It feels good. Have you ever felt cephalic hair before? Only on children sometimes. This is different. She was stroking again. In what way? Selden, even amid his embarrassment, found it possible to be curious. I can't say. It's just different. After a while, he said, Have you had enough? No, don't rush me. Can you make it lie any way you want it to? Not really. It has a natural way of falling but I need a comb for that, and I don't have one with me. A comb? An object with prongs, uh, like a fork, but the prongs are more numerous and somewhat softer. Can you use your fingers? She was running hers through his hair. He said, After a fashion, it doesn't work very well. It's bristly behind. The hair is shorter there. Raindrop 43 seemed to recall something. The eyebrows, she said. Isn't that what they're called? She stripped off the shields, then ran her fingers through the gentle arc of hair against the grain. That's nice, she said then laughed in a high-pitched way that was almost like her younger sister's giggle. They're cute. Selden said a little impatiently, Is there anything else that's part of the condition? In the rather dim light, Raindrop 43 looked as though she might be considering an affirmative, but said nothing. Instead, she suddenly withdrew her hands and lifted them to her nose. Selden wondered what she might be smelling. How odd, she said. May I, may I do it again another time? Selden said uneasily, If you will let me have the book long enough to study it, then perhaps... Raindrop 43 reached into her kirtle through a slit that Selden had not noticed before, and from some hidden inner pocket removed a book bound in some tough, flexible material. He took it, trying to control his excitement. While Selden readjusted his skin cap to cover his hair, Raindrop 43 raised her hands to her nose again, and then, gently and quickly, licked one finger. Forty-seven. Felt your hair, said Doris Van Abelie. She looked at Selden's hair as though she was of a mind to feel it herself. Selden moved away slightly. Please don't. The woman made it seem like a perversion. I suppose it was, 
from her standpoint. Did you derive no pleasure from it yourself? Pleasure? It gave me goose flesh. When she finally stopped, I was able to breathe again. I kept thinking, what other conditions will she make? Doris laughed. Were you afraid that she would force sex upon you? Or hopeful? I assure you, I didn't dare think. I just wanted the book. They were in their room now, and Doris turned on her field distorter to make sure they would not be overheard. The Mycogenian night was about to begin. Selden had removed his skin cap and kirtle and had bathed, paying particular attention to his hair, which he had foamed and rinsed twice. He was now sitting on his cot, wearing a light nightgown that had been hanging in the closet. Doris said, eyes dancing, did she know you have hair on your chest? I was hoping earnestly she wouldn't think of that. Poor Harry. It was all perfectly natural, you know. I would probably have had similar trouble if I was alone with a brother. Worse, I'm sure, since he would believe, Mycogenian society being what it is, that as a woman I would be bound to obey his orders without delay or demur. No, Doris, you may think it was perfectly natural, but you didn't experience it. The poor woman was in a high state of sexual excitement. She engaged all her senses, smelled her fingers, licked them. If she could have heard hair grow, she would have listened avidly. But that's what I mean by natural. Anything you make forbidden gains sexual attractiveness. Would you be particularly interested in women's breasts if you lived in a society in which they were displayed at all times? I think I might. Wouldn't you be more interested if they were always hidden, as in most societies they are? Listen, let me tell you something that happened to me. I was at a lake resort back home on Sinna. I presume you have resorts on Helicon, beaches, that sort of thing? Of course, said Selden, slightly annoyed. What do you think Helicon is, a world of rocks and mountains with only well water to drink? No offense, Harry. I just want to make sure you'll get the point of the story. On our beaches at Sinna, we're pretty light-hearted about what we wear, or don't wear. Nude beaches? Not actually, though I suppose if someone removed all of his or her clothing it wouldn't be much remarked on. The custom is to wear a decent minimum, but I must admit that what we consider decent leaves very little to the imagination. Selden said, We have somewhat higher standards of decency on Helicon. Yes, I could tell that by your careful treatment of me, but to each its own. In any case, I was sitting at the small beach by the lake, and a young man approached to whom I had spoken earlier in the day. He was a decent fellow I found nothing particularly wrong with. He sat on the arm of my chair and placed his right hand on my left thigh, which was bare, of course, in order to steady himself. After we had spoken for a minute and a half or so, he said impishly, Here I am. You know me hardly at all, and yet it seems perfectly natural to me that I place my hand on your thigh. What's more, it seems perfectly natural to you, since you don't seem to mind that it remains there. It was only then that I actually noticed that his hand was on my thigh. Bare skin in public somehow loses some of its sexual quality. As I said, it's the hiding from view that is crucial. And the young man felt this too, for he went on to say, Yet if I were to meet you under more formal conditions, and you were wearing a gown, you wouldn't dream of letting me lift your gown and place my hand on your thigh on the precise spot it now occupies. I laughed, and we continued to talk of this and that. 
Of course, the young man, now that my attention had been called to the position of his hand, felt it no longer appropriate to keep it there, and removed it. That night I dressed for dinner with more than usual care, and appeared in clothing that was considerably more formal than was required, or than other women in the dining room were wearing. I found the young man in question. He was sitting at one of the tables. I approached, greeted him, and said, Here I am in a gown, but under it my left thigh is bare. I give you permission. Just lift the gown and place your hand on my left thigh where you had it earlier. He tried. I'll give him credit for that. But everyone was staring. I wouldn't have stopped him, and I'm sure no one else would have stopped him either. But he couldn't bring himself to do it. It was no more public then than it had been earlier, and the same people were present in both cases. It was clear that I had taken the initiative and that I had no objections. But he could not bring himself to violate the proprieties. The conditions, which had been hand on thigh in the afternoon, were not hand on thigh in the evening, and that meant more than anything logic could say. Selden said, I would have put my hand on your thigh. Are you sure? Positive. Even though your standards of decency on the beach are higher than ours are? Yes. Doris sat down on her own cot, then lay down with her hands behind her head. So that you're not particularly disturbed that I'm wearing a nightgown with very little underneath it. I'm not particularly shocked. As for being disturbed, that depends on the definition of the word. I'm certainly aware of how you're dressed. Well, if we're going to be cooped up here for a period of time, we'll have to learn to ignore such things. Or take advantage of them, said Selden, grinning. And I like your hair. After seeing you bald all day, I like your hair. Well, don't touch it. I haven't washed it yet. She half closed her eyes. It's interesting. You've detached the informal and formal level of respectability. What you're saying is that Helicon is more respectable at the informal level than Cinna is, and less respectable at the formal level. Is that right? Actually, I'm just talking about the young man who placed his hand on your thigh and myself. How representative we are as Cinnians and Heliconians, respectively, I can't say. I can easily imagine some perfectly proper individuals on both worlds, and some madcaps, too. We're talking about social pressures. I'm not exactly a galactic traveler, but I've had to involve myself in a great deal of social history. On the planet of Deraud, there was a time when premarital sex was absolutely free. Multiple sex was allowed for the unmarried, and public sex was frowned upon only when traffic was blocked. And yet, after marriage, monogamy was absolute and unbroken. The theory was that by working off all one's fantasies first, one could settle down to the serious business of life. Did it work? About three hundred years ago that stopped. But some of my colleagues say it stopped through external pressure, from other worlds who were losing too much tourist business to Duraud. There is such a thing as overall galactic social pressure, too. Or perhaps economic pressure, in this case. Perhaps. And being at the university, by the way, I get a chance to study social pressures, even without being a galactic traveler. I meet people from scores of places, inside and outside of Trantor, and one of the pet amusements in the social science departments is the comparison of social pressures. Here in Mycogen, for instance, I have the impression that sex is strictly controlled, 
and is permitted under only the most stringent rules, all the more tightly enforced because it is never discussed. In the streeling sector, sex is never discussed either, but it isn't condemned. In the Jeanette sector, where I spent a week once doing research, sex is discussed endlessly, but only for the purpose of condemning it. I don't suppose there are any two sectors in Trantor, or any two worlds outside Trantor, in which attitudes toward sex are completely duplicated. Selden said, You know what you make it sound like? It would appear. Doris said, I'll tell you how it appears. All this talk of sex makes one thing clear to me. I'm simply not going to let you out of my sight any more. What? Twice I let you go. The first time through my own misjudgment, and the second because you bullied me into it. Both times it was clearly a mistake. You know what happened to you the first time. Selden said indignantly, Yes, but nothing happened to me the second time. You nearly got into a lot of trouble. Suppose you had been caught indulging in sexual escapades with a sister. It wasn't a sexual. You yourself said she was in a high state of sexual excitement. But it was wrong. Please get it through your head, Harry. From now on, you go nowhere without me. Look, said Selden freezingly, my object was to find out about my Cogenian history, and as a result of the so-called sexual escapade with a sister, I have a book. The book. The book. True, there's the book. Let's see it. Selden produced it, and Doris thoughtfully hefted it. She said, It might not do us any good, Harry. This doesn't look as though it will fit any projector I've ever encountered. That means you'll have to get a Mycogenian projector, and they'll want to know why you want it. They'll then find out you have this book, and they'll take it away from you. Selden smiled. If your assumptions were correct, Doris, your conclusions would be inescapable. But it happens that this is not the kind of book you think it is. It's not meant to be projected. The material is printed on various pages, and the pages are turned. Raindrop 43 explained that much to me. A print book! It was hard to tell whether Doris was shocked or amused. That's from the Stone Age. It's certainly pre-Empire, said Selden, but not entirely so. Have you ever seen a print book? Considering that I'm a historian? Of course, Harry. Ah, but like this one. He handed over the book, and Doris, smiling, opened it, then turned to another page, then flipped the pages. It's blank, she said. It appears to be blank. The Mycogenians are stubbornly primitivistic, but not entirely so. They will keep to the essence of the primitive, but have no objection to using modern technology to modify it for convenience's sake. Who knows? Maybe so, Harry, but I don't understand what you're saying. The pages aren't blank. They're covered with microprint. Here, give it back. If I press this little nubbin on the inner edge of the cover, look. The page to which the book lay open was suddenly covered with lines of print that rolled slowly upward. Selden said, You can adjust the rate of upward movement to match your reading speed by slightly twisting the nubbin one way or the other. When the lines of print reach their upward limit, when you reach the bottom line, that is, they snap downward and turn off. You turn to the next page and continue. 
Where does the energy come from that does all this? It has an enclosed microfusion battery that lasts the life of the book. Then, when it runs down, you discard the book, which you may be required to do even before it runs down, given wear and tear, and get another copy. You never replace the battery. Doris took the book a second time and looked at it from all sides. She said, I must admit I never heard of a book like this. Nor I. The galaxy generally has moved into visual technology so rapidly it skipped over this possibility. This is visual. Yes, but not with the orthodox effects. This type of book has its advantages. It holds far more than an ordinary visual book does. Doris said, Where's the turn-on? Ah, let me see if I can work it. She had opened to a page at random and set the lines of print marching upward. Then she said, I'm afraid this won't do you any good, Harry. It's pre-galactic. I don't mean the book. I mean the print, the language. Can you read it, Doris, as a historian? As a historian, I'm used to dealing with archaic language, but within limits. This is far too ancient for me. I can make out a few words here and there, but not enough to be useful. Good, said Selden. If it's really ancient, it will be useful. Not if you can't read it. I can read it, said Selden. It's bilingual. You don't suppose that Raindrop 43 can read the ancient script, do you? If she's educated properly, why not? Because I suspect that women in Mycogen are not educated past household duties. Some of the more learned men can read this, but everyone else would need a translation to Galactic. He pushed another nubbin, and this supplies it. The lines of print changed to galactic standard. Delightful, said Doors in admiration. We could learn from these Mycogenians, but we don't. We haven't known about it. I can't believe that. I know about it now, and you know about it. There must be outsiders coming into Mycogen now and then, for commercial or political reasons or there wouldn't be skin caps so ready for use. So every once in a while, someone must have caught a glimpse of this sort of print book and seen how it works. But it's probably dismissed as something curious but not worth further study, simply because it's mycogenian. But is it worth study? Of course, everything is, or should be. Humman would probably point to this lack of concern about these books as a sign of degeneration in the Empire. He lifted the book and said with a gush of excitement, But I am curious, and I will read this, and it may push me in the direction of psychohistory. I hope so, said Doors. But if you take my advice, you'll sleep first and approach it fresh in the morning, you won't learn much if you nod over it. Selden hesitated, then said, How maternal you are. I'm watching over you. But I have a mother alive on Helicon. I would rather you were my friend. As for that, I have been your friend since first I met you. She smiled at him and Selden hesitated, as though he were not certain as to the appropriate rejoinder. Finally, he said, Then I'll take your advice, as a friend, and sleep before reading. He made as though to put the book on a small table between the two cots, hesitated, turned, and put it under his pillow. Doris Vanabelli laughed softly. I think you're afraid I will wake during the night and read parts of the book before you have a chance to. Is that it? 
Well, said Selden, trying not to look ashamed, that may be it. Even friendship only goes so far, and this is my book, and it's my psychohistory. I agree, said Doris. And I promise you that we won't quarrel over that. By the way, you were about to say something earlier when I interrupted you. Remember? Selden thought briefly. No. In the dark, he thought only of the book. He gave no thought to the hand-on-thigh story. In fact, he had already quite forgotten it, consciously at least. 48. Vanabelly woke up and could tell by her time band that the night period was only half over. Not hearing Harry's snore, she could tell that his cot was empty. If he had not left the apartment, then he was in the bathroom. She tapped lightly on the door and said softly, Harry? He said, Come in, in an abstracted way, and she did. The toilet lid was down, and Selden, seated upon it, held the book open on his lap. He said, quite unnecessarily, I'm reading. Yes, I see that. But why? I couldn't sleep. I'm sorry. But why read in here? If I had turned on the room light, I would have woken you up. Are you sure the book can't be illuminated? Pretty sure. When Raindrop 43 described its workings, she never mentioned illumination. Besides, I suppose that would use up so much energy that the battery wouldn't last the life of the book. He sounded dissatisfied. Doris said, You can step out then. I want to use this place as long as I'm here. When she emerged, she found him sitting cross-legged on his cot, still reading, with the room well lighted. She said, You don't look happy. Does the book disappoint you? He looked up at her, blinking. Yes, it does. I've sampled it here and there. It's all I've had time to do. The thing is a virtual encyclopedia, and the index is almost entirely a listing of people and places that are of little use for my purposes. It has nothing to do with the Galactic Empire or the pre-imperial kingdoms either. It deals almost entirely with a single world, and, as nearly as I can make out from what I have read, it is an endless dissertation on internal politics. Perhaps you underestimate its age. It may deal with a period when there was indeed only one world, one inhabited world. Yes, I know, said Selden a little impatiently. That's actually what I want, provided I can be sure it's history, not legend. I wonder. I don't want to believe it just because I want to believe it. Dora said, Well, this matter of a single world origin is much in the air these days. Human beings are a single species spread all over the galaxy, so they must have originated somewhere. At least, that's the popular view at present. You can't have independent origins producing the same species on different worlds. But I've never seen the inevitability of that argument, said Selden. If human beings arose on a number of worlds as a number of different species, why couldn't they have interbred into some single intermediate species? Because species can't interbreed. That's what makes them species. Selden thought about it a moment, then dismissed it with a shrug. Well, I'll leave it to the biologists. They're precisely the ones who are keenest on the Earth hypothesis. Earth? Is that what they call the supposed world of origin? That's a popular name for it, though there's no way of telling what it was called, assuming there was one, and no one has any clue to what its location might be. Earth, 
said Selden, curling his lips. It sounds like a belch to me. In any case, if the book deals with the original world, I didn't come across it. How do you spell the world? She told him, and he checked the book quickly. There you are. The name is not listed in the index, either by that spelling or any reasonable alternative. Really? And they do mention other worlds in passing. Names aren't given, and there seems no interest in those other worlds, except insofar as they directly impinge on the local world they speak of, at least as far as I can see from what I've read. In one place they talked about the fifty. I don't know what they meant. Fifty leaders, fifty cities. It seemed to me to be fifty worlds. Did they give a name to their own world, this world that seems to preoccupy them entirely? asked Doris. If they don't call it Earth, what do they call it? As you'd expect, they call it the world or the planet. Sometimes they call it the oldest or the world of the dawn, which has a poetic significance, I presume, that isn't clear to me. I suppose one ought to read the book entirely through, and some matters will then grow to make more sense. He looked down at the book in his hand with some distaste. It would take a very long time, though, and I'm not sure that I'd end up any the wiser. Doors sighed. I'm sorry, Harry. You sound so disappointed. That's because I am disappointed. It's my fault, though. I should not have allowed myself to expect too much. At one point, come to think of it, they referred to their world as Aurora. Aurora, said Doris, lifting her eyebrows. It sounds like a proper name. It doesn't make any sense otherwise, as far as I can see. Does it mean anything to you, Doris? Aurora. Doris thought about it with a slight frown on her face. I can't say I've ever heard of a planet with that name in the course of the history of the Galactic Empire, or during the period of its growth, for that matter. But I won't pretend to know the name of every one of the twenty-five million worlds. We could look it up in the university library, if we ever get back to Streeling. There's no use trying to find a library here in Mycogen. Somehow I have a feeling that all their knowledge is in the book. If anything isn't there, they aren't interested. Selden yawned and said, I think you're right. In any case, there's no use reading any more, and I doubt that I can keep my eyes open any longer. Is it all right if I put out the light? I would welcome it, Harry. And let's sleep a little later in the morning. Then, in the dark, Selden said softly, Of course, some of what they say is ridiculous. For instance, they refer to a life expectancy on their world of between three and four centuries. Centuries? Yes, they count their ages by decades rather than by years. It gives you a queer feeling, because so much of what they say is perfectly matter-of-fact that when they come out with something that odd, you almost find yourself trapped into believing it. If you feel yourself beginning to believe that, then you should realize that many legends of primitive origins assume extended lifespans for early leaders. If they're pictured as unbelievably heroic, you see, it seems natural that they have lifespans to suit. Is that so? said Selden, yawning again. It is. And the cure for advanced gullibility is to go to sleep and consider matters again the next day. And Selden, pausing only long enough to think that an extended lifespan might well be a simple necessity for anyone trying to understand a galaxy of people, slept. 49.
The next morning, feeling relaxed and refreshed and eager to begin his study of the book again, Harry asked Doris, How old would you say the Raindrop Sisters are? I don't know. Twenty? Twenty-two? Well, suppose they do live three or four centuries. Harry, that's ridiculous. I'm saying suppose. In mathematics, we say, suppose all the time, and see if we can end up with something patently untrue or self-contradictory. An extended lifespan would almost surely mean an extended period of development. They might seem in their early twenties, and actually be in their sixties. You can try asking them how old they are. We can assume they'd lie. Look up their birth certificates. Selden smiled wryly. I'll bet you anything you like, a roll in the hay if you're willing, that they'll claim they don't keep records, or that if they do, they will insist those records are closed to tribespeople. No bet, said Doris. And if that's true, then it's useless trying to suppose anything about their age. Oh, no. Think of it this way. If the Mycogenians are living extended lifespans that are four or five times that of ordinary human beings, they can't very well give birth to very many children without expanding their population tremendously. You remember that Sunmaster said something about not having the population expand and bit off his remarks angrily at that time. Doris said, what are you getting at? When I was with Raindrop 43, I saw no children. On the microfarms? Yes. Did you expect children there? I was with Raindrop 45 in the shops and on the residential levels, and I assure you I saw a number of children of all ages, including infants, quite a few of them. Ah. Selden looked chagrined. Then that would mean they can't be enjoying extended lifespans. Doris said, By your line of argument, I should say definitely not. Did you really think they did? No, not really. But then you can't close your mind either and make assumptions without testing them one way or another. You can waste a lot of time that way, too if you stop to chew away at things that are ridiculous on the face of it. Some things that seem ridiculous on the face of it aren't. That's all. Which reminds me, you're the historian. In your work, have you ever come across objects or phenomena called robots? Ah, now you're switching to another legend, and a very popular one. There are any number of worlds that imagine the existence of machines in human form in prehistoric times. These are called robots. The tales of robots probably originate from one master legend, for the general theme is the same. Robots were devised, then grew in numbers and abilities to the status of the almost superhuman. They threatened humanity and were destroyed. In every case, the destruction took place before the actual reliable historic records available to us today existed. The usual feeling is that the story is a symbolic picture of the risks and dangers of exploring the galaxy, when human beings expanded outward from the world, or worlds that were their original homes. There must always have been the fear of encountering other and superior intelligences. Perhaps they did at least once, and that gave rise to the legend. Except that on no human-occupied world has there been any record or trace of any pre-human or non-human intelligence. But why robots? Does the word have meaning? Not that I know of, but it's the equivalent of the familiar automata. Automata. Well, why don't they say so? Because people do use archaic terms for flavor when they tell an ancient legend. 
Why do you ask all this, by the way? Because in this ancient Mycogenian book they talk of robots, and very favorably, by the way. Listen, Doris, aren't you going out with Raindrop 45 again this afternoon? Supposedly, if she shows up. Would you ask her some questions and try to get the answers out of her? I can try. What are the questions? I would like to find out, as tactfully as possible, if there is some structure in mycogen that is particularly significant, that is tied in with the past, that has a sort of mythic value that can... Doors interrupted, trying not to smile. I think that what you are trying to ask is whether mycogen has a temple. And inevitably, Selden looked blank and said, What's a temple? Another archaic term of uncertain origin. It means all the things you asked about. Significance, past, myth. Very well, I'll ask. It's the sort of thing, however, that they might find difficult to speak of. To tribespeople, certainly. Nevertheless, do try. Sacratorium Aurora, a mythical world supposedly inhabited in primordial times during the dawn of interstellar travel. It is thought by some to be the perhaps equally mythical world of origin of humanity and to be another name for Earth. The people of the Mycogen, QV, sector of ancient Trantor reportedly held themselves to be descended from the inhabitants of Aurora and made that tenet central to their system of beliefs concerning which almost nothing else is known. Encyclopedia Galactica 50. The two raindrops arrived at mid-morning. Raindrop 45 seemed as cheerful as ever, but Raindrop 43 paused just inside the door, looking drawn and circumspect. She kept her eyes down and did not as much as glance at Selden. Selden looked uncertain and gestured to Doors, who said in a cheerful, business-like tone of voice, One moment, sisters. I must give instructions to my man, or he won't know what to do with himself today. They moved into the bathroom, and Doors whispered, Is something wrong? Yes. Raindrop 43 is obviously shattered. Please tell her that I will return the book as soon as possible. Doris favored Selden with a long, surprised look. Harry, she said, you're a sweet, caring person, but you haven't the good sense of an amoeba. If I as much as mention the book to the poor woman, she'll be certain that you told me all about what happened yesterday, and then she'll really be shattered. The only hope is to treat her exactly as I would ordinarily. Selden nodded his head and said dispiritedly, I suppose you're right. Doris returned in time for dinner and found Selden on his cot, still leafing through the book, but with intensified impatience. He looked up with a scowl and said, If we're going to be staying here any length of time, we're going to need a communication device of some sort between us. I had no idea when you'd get back, and I was a little concerned. Well, here I am, she said, removing her skin cap gingerly, and looking at it with more than a little distaste. I'm really pleased at your concern. I rather thought you'd be so lost in the book you wouldn't even realize I was gone. Selden snorted. Doris said, as for communications devices, I doubt that they are easy to come by in mycogen. It would mean easing communication with tribespeople outside, and I suspect the leaders of mycogen are bound and determined to cut down on any possible interaction with the great beyond. Yes, said Selden, tossing the book to one side. I would expect that from what I see in the book. 
Did you find out about the, whatever you called it, uh, the temple? Yes, she said, removing her eyebrow patches. It exists. There are a number of them over the area of the sector, but there's a central building that seems to be the important one. Would you believe that one woman noticed my eyelashes and told me that I shouldn't let myself be seen in public? I have a feeling she intended to report me for indecent exposure. Never mind that, said Selden impatiently. Do you know where the central temple is located? I have directions, but Raindrop 45 warned me that women were not allowed inside except on special occasions, none of which are coming up soon. It's called the Sacratorium. The what? The Sacratorium. What an ugly word. What does it mean? Doris shook her head. It's new to me, and neither Raindrop knew what it meant either. To them, Sacratorium isn't what the building is called, it's what it is. Asking them why they called it that probably sounded like asking them why a wall is called a wall. Is there anything about it they do know? Of course, Harry. They know what it's for. It's a place that's devoted to something other than the life here in Mycogen. It's devoted to another world, a former and better one. The world they once lived on, you mean? Exactly. Raindrop 45 all but said so, but not quite. She couldn't bring herself to say the word. Aurora? That's the word. But I suspect that if you were to say it out loud to a group of Mycogenians, they would be shocked and horrified. Raindrop 45, when she said, The Sacratorium is dedicated to... stopped at that point, and carefully wrote out the letters one by one with her finger on the palm of her hand. And she blushed as though she was doing something obscene. Strange, said Selden. If the book is an accurate guide, Aurora is their dearest memory, their chief point of unification, the center about which everything in mycogen revolves. Why should its mention be considered obscene? Are you sure you didn't misinterpret what the sister meant? I'm positive. And perhaps it's no mystery. Too much talk about it would get to tribespeople. The best way of keeping it secret unto themselves is to make its very mention taboo. Taboo. A specialized anthropological term. It's a reference to serious and effective social pressure forbidding some sort of action. The fact that women are not allowed in the sacratorium probably has the force of a taboo. I'm sure that a sister would be horrified if it was suggested that she invade its precincts. Are the directions you have good enough for me to get to the sacratorium on my own? In the first place, Harry, you're not going alone. I'm going with you. I thought we had discussed the matter, and that I had made it clear that I cannot protect you at long distance. Not from sleet storms, and not from feral women. In the second place, it's impractical to think of walking there. Mycogen may be a small sector, as sectors go, but it simply isn't that small. An expressway, then. There are no expressways passing through Mycogenian territory. It would make contact between Mycogenians and tribespeople too easy. Still, there are public conveyances of the kind that are found on less developed planets. In fact, that's what mycogen is, a piece of an undeveloped planet, embedded like a splinter in the body of Trantor, which is otherwise a patchwork of developed societies. And, Harry, finish with the book as soon as possible. It's apparent that Rainbow 43 is in trouble as long as you have it, and so will we be if they find out. Do you mean a tribesperson reading it is taboo? 
I'm sure of it. Well, it would be no great loss to give it back. I should say that 95% of it is incredibly dull. Endless infighting among political groups. Endless justification of policies whose wisdom I cannot possibly judge. Endless homilies on ethical matters, which even when enlightened, and they usually aren't, are couched with such infuriating self-righteousness as to almost enforce violation. You sound as though I would be doing you a great favor if I took the thing away from you. Except that there's always the other 5% that discusses the never-to-be-mentioned Aurora. I keep thinking that there may be something there and that it may be helpful to me. That's why I wanted to know about the Sacratorium. Do you hope to find support for the book's concept of Aurora in the Sacratorium? In a way. And I'm also terribly caught up in what the book has to say about automata, or robots, to use their term. I find myself attracted to the concept. Surely you don't take it seriously. Almost. If you accept some passages of the book literally, then there is an implication that some robots were in human shape. Naturally, if you're going to construct a simulacrum of a human being, you will make it look like a human being. Yes, simulacrum means likeness, but a likeness can be crude indeed. An artist can draw a stick figure, and you might know he is representing a human being and recognize it. A circle for the head, a stalk for the body, and four bent lines for arms and legs, and you have it. But I mean robots that really look like a human being in every detail. Ridiculous, Harry. Imagine the time it would take to fashion the metal of the body into perfect proportions, with the smooth curve of underlying muscles. Who said metal, Doors? The impression I got is that such robots were organic or pseudo-organic, that they were covered with skin, that you could not easily draw a distinction between them and human beings in any way. Does the book say that? Not in so many words. The inference, however, is your inference, Harry. You can't take it seriously. Let me try. I find four things that I can deduce from what the book says about robots, and I followed up every reference the index gave. First, as I say, they, or some of them, exactly resembled human beings. Second, they had very extended lifespans, if you want to call it that. Better say effectiveness, said Doors, or you'll begin thinking of them as human altogether. Third, said Selden, ignoring her, that some, or at any rate at least one, continues to live on to this day. Harry, that's one of the most widespread legends we have. The ancient hero does not die, but remains in suspended animation, ready to return to save his people at some time of great need. Really, Harry? Fourth, said Selden, still not rising to the bait, there are some lines that seem to indicate that the central temple, or the sacratorium, if that's what it is, though I haven't found that word in the book, actually, contains a robot. He paused, then said, Do you see... Doris said, No, what should I see? If we combine the four points, perhaps a robot that looks exactly like a human being and that is still alive, having been alive for, say, the last 20,000 years, is in the Sacratorium. Come on, Harry, you can't believe that. I don't actually believe it, but I can't entirely let go either. What if it's true? What if... It's only one chance out of a million, I admit. It's true. Don't you see how useful he could be to me? 
He could remember the galaxy as it was long before any reliable historical records existed. He might help make psychohistory possible. Even if it was true, do you suppose the Mycogenians would let you see and interview the robot? I don't intend to ask permission. I can at least go to the Sacratorium and see if there's something to interview first. Not now. Tomorrow at the earliest. And if you don't think better of it by morning, we go. You told me yourself they don't allow women. They allow women to look at it from outside, I'm sure, and I suspect that is all we'll get to do. And there she was adamant. 51. Harry Selden was perfectly willing to let Doris take the lead. She had been out in the main roadways of Mycogen and was more at home with them than he was. Doris Vanavoli, brows knitted, was less delighted with the prospect. She said, We can easily get lost, you know. Not with that booklet, said Selden. She looked up at him impatiently. Fix your mind on mycogen, Harry. What I should have is a computo map, something I can ask questions of. This mycogenian version is just a piece of folded plastic. I can't tell this thing where I am. I can't tell it by word of mouth, and I can't even tell it by pushing the necessary contacts. It can't tell me anything either way. It's a print thing. Then read what it says. That's what I'm trying to do, but it's written for people who are familiar with the system to begin with. We'll have to ask. No, Doors, that would be a last resort. I don't want to attract attention. I would rather we take our chances and try to find our own way, even if it means making one or two wrong turns. Doors leafed through the booklet with great attention, and then said grudgingly, Well, it gives the Sacratorium important mention. I suppose that's only natural. I presume everyone in Mycogen would want to get there at one time or another. Then, after additional concentration, she said, I'll tell you what. There's no way of taking a conveyance from here to there. What? Don't get excited. Apparently there's a way of getting from here to another conveyance that will take us there. We'll have to change from one to another. Selden relaxed. Well, of course. You can't take an expressway to half the places on Trentor without changing. Doris cast an impatient glance at Selden. I know that, too. It's just that I'm used to having these things tell me so. When they expect you to find out for yourself, the simplest things can escape you for a while. All right, dear, don't snap. If you know the way now, lead. I will follow humbly. And follow her he did, until they came to an intersection where they stopped. Three white-kirtled males and a pair of gray-kirtled females were at the same intersection. Selden tried a universal and general smile in their direction, but they responded with a blank stare and looked away. And then the conveyance came. It was an outmoded version of what Selden, back on Helicon, would have called a grab -a bus There were some twenty upholstered benches inside each capable of holding four people. Each bench had its own doors on both sides of the bus. When it stopped, passengers emerged on either side. For a moment, Selden was concerned for those who got out on the traffic side of the gravibus, bus, but then he noticed that every vehicle approaching from either direction stopped as it neared the bus. None passed it while it was not moving. Doris pushed Selden impatiently, and he moved on to a bench where two adjoining seats were available. Doris followed after. The men always got on and got off first, he noticed. 
Doris muttered to him. Stop studying humanity. Be aware of your surroundings. I'll try. For instance, she said, and pointed to a smooth, boxed-off area on the back of the bench directly before each of them. As soon as the conveyance had begun to move, words lit up, naming the next stop, and the notable structures or crossways that were nearby. Now that will probably tell us when we're approaching the changeover we want. At least the sector isn't completely barbaric. Good, said Selden. Then, after a while, leaning toward doors, he whispered, No one is looking at us. It seems that artificial boundaries are set up to preserve individual privacy in any crowded place. Have you noticed that? I've always taken it for granted. If that's going to be a rule of your psychohistory, no one will be very impressed by it. As Doors had guessed, the direction plaque in front of them eventually announced the approach to the changeover for the direct line to the sacratorium. They exited and again had to wait. Some buses ahead had already left this intersection, but another gravibus was already approaching. They were on a well-traveled route, which was not surprising. The sacratorium was bound to be the center and heartbeat of the sector. They got on the gravibus, and Selden whispered, We're not paying. According to the map, public transportation is a free service. Selden thrust out his lower lip. How civilized! I suppose that nothing is all of a piece, not backwardness, not barbarism, nothing. But Doris nudged him and whispered, Your rule is broken. We're being watched, the man on your right. 52. Selden's eyes shifted briefly. The man to his right was rather thin and seemed quite old. He had dark brown eyes and a swarthy complexion, and Selden was sure that he would have had black hair if he had not been depilated. He faced front again, thinking... This brother was rather atypical. The few brothers he had paid any attention to had been rather tall, light-skinned, and with blue or gray eyes. Of course, he had not seen enough of them to make a general rule. Then there was a light touch on the right sleeve of his kirtle. Selden turned hesitantly and found himself looking at a card on which was written lightly, Careful Tribesman. Selden started and put a hand to his skin cap automatically. The man next to him silently mouthed, Hair. Selden's hand found it, a tiny exposure of bristles at his temple. He must have disturbed the skin cap at some point or another. Quickly and as unobtrusively as possible, he tugged the skin cap, then made sure it was snug under the pretense of stroking his head. He turned to his neighbor on his right, nodded slightly, and mouthed, Thank you. His neighbor smiled and said in a normal speaking voice, Going to the sacratorium? Selden nodded. Yes, I am. Easy guess. So am I. Shall we get off together? His smile was friendly. I'm uh, with my, my, with your woman, of course. All three together, then? Selden was not sure how to react. A quick look in the other direction showed him that Dora's eyes were turned straight ahead. She was showing no interest in masculine conversation, an attitude appropriate for a sister. However, Selden felt a soft pat on his left knee, which he took, with perhaps little justification, to mean, It's all right. In any case, his natural sense of courtesy was on that side, and he said, Yes, certainly. There was no further conversation until the direction plaque told them they were arriving at the sacratorium, and Selden's Mycogenian friend was rising to get off. 
The Grava bus made a wide turn about the perimeter of a large area of the Sacratorium grounds, and there was a general exodus when it came to a halt, the men sliding in front of the women to exit first. The women followed. The Mycogenian's voice crackled a bit with age, but it was cheerful. He said, It's a little early for lunch, my friends, but take my word for it that things will be crowded in not too long a time. Would you be willing to buy something simple now and eat it outside? I am very familiar with this area, and I know a good place. Selden wondered if this was a device to maneuver innocent tribespeople into something or other disreputable or costly, yet decided to chance it. You're very kind, he said. Since we are not at all familiar with the place, we will be glad to let you take the lead. They bought lunch, sandwiches, and a beverage that looked like milk at an open-air stand. Since it was a beautiful day, and they were visitors, the old Mycogenian said they would go to the Sacratorium grounds and eat out of doors, the better to become acquainted with their surroundings. During their walk, carrying their lunch, Selden noted that, on a very small scale, the Sacratorium resembled the Imperial Palace, and that the grounds around it resembled, on a minute scale, the Imperial Grounds. He could scarcely believe that the Mycogenian people admired the imperial institution, or indeed did anything but hate and despise it. Yet the cultural attraction was apparently not to be withstood. It's beautiful, said the Mycogenian with obvious pride. Quite, said Selden, how it glistens in the daylight. The grounds around it, he said, are constructed in imitation of the government grounds on our dawn world, in miniature, to be sure. Did you ever see the grounds of the Imperial Palace? asked Selden cautiously. The Mycogenian caught the implication, and seemed in no way put out by it. They copied the dawn world as best they could, too. Selden doubted that in the extreme but he said nothing. They came to a semicircular seat of white stonite, sparkling in the light as the Sacratorium did. Good, said the Mycogenian, his dark eyes gleaming with pleasure. No one's taken my place. I call it mine only because it's my favorite seat. It affords a beautiful view of the side wall of the Sacratorium past the trees. Please sit down. It's not cold, I assure you. And your companion. She is welcome to sit, too. She is a tribeswoman, I know, and has different customs. She... she may speak if she wishes. Doris gave him a hard look and sat down. Selden, recognizing the fact that they might remain with this old Mycogenian a while, thrust out his hand and said... I am Harry, and my female companion is Doors. We don't use numbers, I'm afraid. To each his or her own, said the other expansively. I am Mycelium 72. We are a large cohort. Mycelium, said Selden a bit hesitantly. You seem surprised, said Mycelium. I take it, then, you've only met members of our elder families. Names like Cloud and Sunshine and Starlight, all astronomical. I must admit, began Selden, well, meet one of the lower classes. We take our names from the ground and from the microorganisms we grow. Perfectly respectable. I'm quite certain, said Selden. And thank you again for helping me with my problem in the Gravibus. Listen, said Mycelium 72, I saved you a lot of trouble. If a sister had seen you before I did, she would undoubtedly have screamed, and the nearest brothers would have hustled you off the bus. 
maybe not even waiting for it to stop moving. Doris leaned forward so as to see across Selden. How is it you did not act in this way yourself? I? I have no animosity against tribespeople. I'm a scholar. A scholar? First one in my cohort. I studied at the Sacratorium School and did very well. I'm learned in all the ancient arts, and I have a license to enter the tribal library, where they keep book films and books by tribespeople. I can view any book film or read any book I wish to. We even have a computerized reference library, and I can handle that, too. That sort of thing broadens your mind. I don't mind a little hair showing. I've seen pictures of men with hair many a time. And women, too. He glanced quickly at Doors. They ate in silence for a while, and then Selden said, I notice that every brother who enters or leaves the sacratorium is wearing a red sash. Oh, yes, said Mycelium 72, over the left shoulder and around the right side of the waist, usually very fancily embroidered. Why is that? It's called an obaya. It symbolizes the joy felt at entering the sacratorium and the blood one would spill to preserve it. Blood, said Doris, frowning. Just a symbol. I never actually heard of anyone spilling blood over the sacratorium. For that matter, there isn't that much joy. It's mostly wailing and mourning and prostrating oneself over the lost world. His voice dropped and became soft. Very silly. Doris said, You're not a... A believer? I'm a scholar, said Mycelium with obvious pride. His face wrinkled as he grinned and took on an even more pronounced appearance of age. Selden found himself wondering how old the man was. Several centuries? No, they'd disposed of that. It couldn't be, and yet... How old are you? Selden asked suddenly, involuntarily. Mycelium 72 showed no signs of taking offense at the question, nor did he display any hesitation at answering 67. Selden had to know. I was told that your people believe that in very early times everyone lived for several centuries. Mycelium 72 looked at Selden quizzically. Now, how did you find that out? Someone must have been talking out of turn. But it's true. There is that belief. Only the unsophisticated believe it, but the elders encourage it, because it shows our superiority. Actually, our life expectancy is higher than elsewhere, because we eat more nutritionally, but living even one century is rare. I take it you don't consider Mycogenians superior, said Selden. Mycelium 72 said, There's nothing wrong with Mycogenians. They're certainly not inferior. Still, I think that all men are equal. Even women, he added, looking across at doors. I don't suppose, said Selden, that many of your people would agree with that. Or many of your people, said Mycelium 72, with a faint resentment. I believe it, though. A scholar has to. I viewed and even read all the great literature of the tribespeople. I understand your culture. I've written articles on it. I can sit here just as comfortably with you as though you were... us. Doris said a little sharply, You sound proud of understanding tribespeople's ways. Have you ever traveled outside Mycogen? Mycelium 72 seemed to move away a little. No. Why not? You would get to know us better. I wouldn't feel right. I'd have to wear a wig. I'd be ashamed. Doris said, Why a wig? You could stay bald. 
No, said my Sally M72. I wouldn't be that kind of fool. I'd be mistreated by all the hairy ones. Mistreated? Why? said Doors. We have a great many naturally bald people everywhere on Trantor, and on every other world, too. My father is quite bald, said Selden with a sigh, and I presume that in the decades to come I will be bald, too. My hair isn't all that thick now. That's not bald, said Mycelium 72. You keep hair around the edges and over your eyes. I mean bald. No hair at all. Anywhere on your body, said Doors, interested. And now Mycelium 72 looked offended and said nothing. Selden, anxious to get the conversation back on track, said, Tell me, Mycelium 72, can tribespeople enter the Sacratorium as spectators? Mycelium 72 shook his head vigorously. Never. It's for the Sons of the Dawn only. Doris said, Only the Sons? Mycelium 72 looked shocked for a moment, then said forgivingly, Well, your tribe's people. Daughters of the Dawn enter only on certain days and times. That's just the way it is. I don't say I approve. If it was up to me, I'd say, Go in, enjoy if you can. Sooner others than me, in fact. Don't you ever go in? When I was young, my parents took me. But, he shook his head, it was just people staring at the book and reading from it and sighing and weeping for the old days. It's very depressing. You can't talk to each other. You can't laugh. You can't even look at each other. Your mind has to be totally on the lost world. Totally. He waved a hand in rejection. Not for me. I'm a scholar, and I want the whole world open to me. Good, said Selden, seeing an opening. We feel that way, too. We are scholars also, Doris and myself. I know, said Mycelium 72. You know? How do you know? You'd have to be. The only tribes people allowed in Mycogen are imperial officials and diplomats, important traders and scholars. And to me, you have the look of scholars. That's what interested me in you. Scholars together. He smiled delightedly. So we are. I am a mathematician. Doris is a historian. And you? I specialize in culture. I've read all the great works of literature of the tribes people. Lissauer, Mentone, Novigor. And we have read the great works of your people. I've read the book, for instance, about the lost world. Mycelium 72's eyes opened wide in surprise. His olive complexion seemed to fade a little. You have? How? Where? At our university, we have copies that we can read if we have permission. Copies of the book? Yes. I wonder if the elders know this. Selden said, And I've read about robots. Robots? Yes. That is why I would like to be able to enter the sacratorium. I would like to see the robot. Doors kicked lightly at Selden's ankle, but he ignored her. Mycelium 72 said uneasily, I don't believe in such things. Scholarly people don't. But he looked about as though he was afraid of being overheard. Selden said, I've read that a robot still exists in the Sacratorium. Mycelium 72 said, I don't want to talk about such nonsense. Selden persisted. Where would it be if it was in the sacratorium? Even if one was there, I couldn't tell you. I haven't been in there since I was a child. 
Would you know if there was a special place, a hidden place? There's the elders' airy. Only elders go there, but there's nothing there. Have you ever been there? No, of course not. Then how do you know? I don't know that there's no pomegranate tree there. I don't know that there's no laser organ there. I don't know that there's no item of a million different kinds there. Does my lack of knowledge of their absence show they are all present? For the moment, Selden had nothing to say. A ghost of a smile broke through Mycelium 72's look of concern. He said, That's scholar's reasoning. I'm not an easy man to tackle, you see. Just the same, I wouldn't advise you to try to get up into the elders' airy. I don't think you'd like what would happen if they found a tribesman inside. Well, best of the dawn to you. And he rose suddenly, without warning, and hurried away. Selden looked after him, rather surprised. What made him rush off like that? I think, said Doors, it's because someone is approaching. And someone was. A tall man in an elaborate white kirtle, crossed by an even more elaborate and subtly glittering red sash, glided solemnly toward them. He had the unmistakable look of a man with authority, and the even more unmistakable look of one who is not pleased. 53. Harry Selden rose as the new Mycogenian approached. He hadn't the slightest idea whether that was the appropriate polite behavior, but he had the distinct feeling it would do no harm. Doris Venabili rose with him and carefully kept her eyes lowered. The other stood before them. He too was an old man, but more subtly aged than Mycelium 72. Age seemed to lend distinction to his still handsome face. His bald head was beautifully round, and his eyes were a startling blue, contrasting sharply with the bright, all but glowing red of his sash. The newcomer said, I see you are tribes people. His voice was more high-pitched than Selden had expected, but he spoke slowly, as though conscious of the weight of authority in every word he uttered. So we are, said Selden, politely but firmly. He saw no reason not to defer to the other's position, but he did not intend to abandon his own. Your names? I am Harry Selden of Helicon. My companion is Doris Vanabili of Sinna. And yours, man of mycogen? The eyes narrowed in displeasure, but he too could recognize an air of authority when he felt it. I am Sky Strip too, he said, lifting his head higher. An elder of the Sacratorium. And your position, tribesman? We, said Selden, emphasizing the pronoun, are scholars of Streeling University. I am a mathematician, and my companion is a historian, and we are here to study the ways of mycogen. By whose authority? By that of Sun Master 14, who greeted us on our arrival. Skystrip 2 fell silent for a moment, and then a small smile appeared on his face, and he took on an air that was almost benign. He said, The High Elder, I know him well. And so you should, said Selden blandly. Is there anything else, Elder? Yes. The Elder strove to regain the high ground. Who was the man who was with you, and who hurried away when I approached? Selden shook his head. We never saw him before, Elder, and know nothing about him. We encountered him purely by accident and asked about the sacratorium. What did you ask him? Two questions, Elder. We asked if that building was the sacratorium, 
and if tribespeople were allowed to enter it. He answered in the affirmative to the first question and in the negative to the second. Quite so. And what is your interest in the sacratorium? Sir, we are here to study the ways of mycogen, and is not the sacratorium the heart and brain of mycogen? It is entirely ours and reserved for us. Even if an elder, the high elder, would arrange for permission in view of our scholarly function? Have you indeed the high elder's permission? Selden hesitated the slightest moment, while Dora's eyes lifted briefly to look at him sideways. He decided he could not carry off a lie of this magnitude. No, he said, not yet. Or ever, said the elder. You are here in mycogen by authority, but even the highest authority cannot exert total control over the public. We value our sacratorium, and the populace can easily grow excited over the presence of a tribesperson anywhere in mycogen, but most particularly in the vicinity of the sacratorium. It would take one excitable person to raise a cry of invasion, and a peaceful crowd such as this one would be turned into one that would be thirsting to tear you apart. I mean that quite literally. For your own good, even if the High Elder has shown you kindness, leave. Now. But the sacratorium, said Selden stubbornly, though Doors was pulling gently at his kirtle. What is there in the sacratorium that can possibly interest you? said the elder. You see it now. There is nothing for you to see in the interior. There is the robot, said Selden. The elder stared at Selden in shocked surprise, and then, bending to bring his lips close to Selden's ear, whispered harshly, Leave now, or I will raise the cry of invasion myself. Nor, were it not for the High Elder, would I give you even this one chance to leave. And Doors, with surprising strength, nearly pulled Selden off his feet as she stepped hastily away, dragging him along until he caught his balance and stepped quickly after her. Fifty-four. It was over breakfast the next morning, not sooner, that Doris took up the subject, and in a way that Selden found most wounding. She said, Well, that was a pretty fiasco yesterday. Selden, who had honestly thought he had gotten away with it without comment, looked sullen. What made it a fiasco? Driven out is what we were. And for what? What did we gain? Only the knowledge that there is a robot in there. Mycelium 72 said there wasn't. Of course he said that. He's a scholar, or thinks he is. And what he doesn't know about the sacratorium would probably fill that library he goes to. You saw the elder's reaction. I certainly did. He would not have reacted like that if there was no robot inside. He was horrified, we knew. That's just your guess, Harry. And even if there was, we couldn't get in. We could certainly try. After breakfast, we go out and buy a sash for me, one of those obayas. I put it on, keep my eyes devoutly downward, and walk right in. Skin cap and all? They'll spot you in a microsecond. No, they won't. We'll go into the library where all the tribespeople data is kept. I'd like to see it anyway. From the library, which is a sacratorium annex, I gather, there will probably be an entrance into the sacratorium. Where you will be picked up at once. Not at all. You heard what Mycelium 72 had to say. 
everyone keeps his eyes down and meditates on their great lost world, Aurora. No one looks at anyone else. It would probably be a grievous breach of discipline to do so. Then I'll find the elders airy. Just like that. At one point, Mycelium 72 said he would advise me not to try to get up into the elders airy. Up. It must be somewhere in that tower of the Sacratorium, the central tower. Doris shook her head. I don't recall the man's exact words, and I don't think you do either. That's a terribly weak foundation to... Wait. She stopped suddenly and frowned. Well, said Selden, there is an archaic word, airy, that means a dwelling place on high. Ah, there you are. You see, we've learned some vital things as the result of what you call a fiasco. And if I can find a living robot that's 20,000 years old, and if it can tell me... Suppose that such a thing exists, which passes belief, and that you find it, which is not very likely... How long do you think you will be able to talk to it before your presence is discovered? I don't know. But if I can prove it exists, and if I can find it, then I'll think of some way to talk to it. It's too late for me to back out now under any circumstances. Hummon should have left me alone when I thought there was no way of achieving psychohistory. Now that it seems there may be, I won't let anything stop me short of being killed. The Mycogenians may oblige, Harry, and you can't run that risk. Yes, I can. I'm going to try. No, Harry. I must look after you, and I can't let you. You must let me. Finding a way to work out psychohistory is more important than my safety. My safety is only important because I may work out psychohistory. Prevent me from doing so, and your task loses its meaning. Think about it. Harry felt himself infused with a renewed sense of purpose. Psychohistory, his nebulous theory that he had such a short while ago despaired ever of proving, loomed larger, more real. Now he had to believe that it was possible. He could feel it in his gut. The pieces seemed to be falling together, and although he couldn't see the whole pattern yet, he was sure the sacratorium would yield another piece to the puzzle. Then I'll go in with you so I can pull you out, you idiot, when the time comes. Women can't enter. What makes me a woman? Only this gray kirtle. You can't see my breasts under it. I don't have a woman-style hairdo with the skin cap on, I have the same washed, unmarked face a man has. The men here don't have stubble. All I need is a white kirtle and a sash, and I can enter. Any sister could do it if she wasn't held back by a taboo. I am not held back by one. You're held back by me. I won't let you. It's too dangerous. No more dangerous for me than for you. But I must take the risk. Then so must I. Why is your imperative greater than mine? Because... Selden paused and thought. Just tell yourself this, said Doris, her voice hard as rock. I won't let you go there without me. If you try, I will knock you unconscious and tie you up. If you don't like that then give up any thought of going alone. Selden hesitated and muttered darkly. He gave up the argument, at least for now. 55. The sky was almost cloudless, but it was a pale blue as though wrapped in a high, thin mist. That, thought Selden, was a good touch. But suddenly he missed the sun itself. No one on Trantor saw the planet's sun unless he or she went upperside, 
and even then only when the natural cloud layer broke. Did native Trantorians miss the sun? Did they give it any thought? When one of them visited another world where a natural sun was in view, did he or she stare, half-blinded at it, with awe? Why, he wondered, did so many people spend their lives not trying to find answers to questions, not even thinking of questions to begin with? Was there anything more exciting in life than seeking answers? His glance shifted to ground level. The wide roadway was lined with low buildings, most of them shops. Numerous individual ground cars moved in both directions, each hugging the right side. They seemed like a collection of antiques, but they were electrically driven and quite soundless. Selden wondered if antique was always a word to sneer at. Could it be that silence made up for slowness? Was there any particular hurry to life after all? There were a number of children on the walkways, and Selden's lips pressed together in annoyance. Clearly, an extended lifespan for the Mycogenians was impossible unless they were willing to indulge in infanticide. The children of both sexes, though it was hard to tell the boys from the girls, wore kirtles that came only a few inches below the knee, making the wild activity of childhood easier. The children also still had hair, reduced to an inch in length at most. But even so, the older ones among them had hoods attached to their kirtles and wore them raised, hiding the top of the head altogether. It was as though they were getting old enough to make the hair seem a trifle obscene, or old enough to be wishing to hide it in longing for the day of rite of passage when they were depilated. A thought occurred to Selden. He said, Doors, when you've been out shopping, who paid, you or the raindrop women? I did, of course. The raindrops never produced a credit tile. But why should they? What was being bought was for us, not for them. But you have a Trentorian credit tile, a tribeswoman credit tile. Of course, Harry, but there was no problem. The people of Mycogen may keep their own culture and ways of thought and habits of life as they wish. They can destroy their cephalic hair and wear kirtles. Nevertheless, they must use the world's credits. If they don't, that would choke off commerce, and no sensible person would want to do that. The credits nerve, Harry. She held up her hand as though she was holding an invisible credit tile. And they accepted your credit tile? Never a peep out of them, and never a word about my skin cap. Credits sanitize everything. Well, that's good. So I can buy. No, I'll do the buying. Credits may sanitize everything, but they more easily sanitize a tribeswoman. They're so used to paying women little or no attention that they automatically pay me the same. And here's the clothing store I've been using. I'll wait out here. Get me a nice red sash, one that looks impressive. Don't pretend you've forgotten our decision. I'll get two, and another white kirtle also, to my measurements. Won't they think it odd that a woman would be buying a white kirtle? Of course not. They'll assume I'm buying it for a male companion who happens to be my size. Actually, I don't think they'll bother with any assumptions at all, as long as my credit tile is good. Selden waited, half expecting someone to come up and greet him as a tribesman, or denounce him as one, more likely, but no one did. Those who passed him did so without a glance, and even those who glanced in his direction moved on seemingly untouched. He was especially nervous about the gray kirtles, the women walking by in pairs, or even worse, with a man. They were downtrodden, unnoticed, snubbed. How better to gain a brief notoriety than by shrieking at the sight of a tribesman? But even the women moved on. They're not expecting to see a tribesman, Selden thought, so they don't see one. That, he decided, augured well for their forthcoming invasion of the Sacratorium. 
how much less would anyone expect to see tribespeople there, and how much more effectively would they therefore fail to see them? He was in fairly good humor when Doors emerged. You have everything? Absolutely. Then let's go back to the room so you can change. The white kirtle did not fit her quite as well as the gray one did. Obviously, she could not have tried it on, or even the densest shopkeeper would have been struck with alarm. How do I look, Harry? she asked. Exactly like a boy, said Selden. Now let's try the sash, or obaya. I had better get used to calling it that. Doors, without her skin cap, was shaking out her hair gratefully. She said sharply, Don't put it on now. We're not going to parade through Mycogen with the sash on. The last thing we want to do is call attention to ourselves. No, no, I just want to see how it goes on. Well, not that one. This one is better quality and more elaborate. You're right, Doris. I've got to gather in what attention there is. I don't want them to detect you as a woman. I'm not thinking of that, Harry. I just want you to look pretty. A thousand thanks, but that's impossible, I suspect. Now let's see, how does this work? Together, Harry and Doris practiced putting their obayas on and taking them off, over and over again, until they could do it in one fluid motion. Doris taught Harry how to do it, as she had seen a man doing it the day before at the sacratorium. When Harry praised her for her acute observations, she blushed and said, It's really nothing, Harry, just something I noticed. Harry replied, Then you're a genius for noticing. Finally satisfied, they stood well apart, each surveying the other. Harry's obaya glittered a bright red dragon-like design standing out against a paler field of similar hue. Doors was a little less bold, had a simple thin line down the center, and was very light in color. There, she said, just enough to show good taste. She took it off. Now, said Selden, we fold it up and it goes into one of the inner pockets. I have my credit tile, Hummins, really, and the key to this place in this one, and here on the other side, the book. The book? Should you be carrying it around? I must. I'm guessing that anyone going to the sacratorium ought to have a copy of the book with him. They may intone passages or have readings. If necessary, we'll share the book, and maybe no one will notice. Ready? I'll never be ready, but I'm going with you. It will be a tedious trip. Will you check my skin cap and make sure no hair shows this time? And don't scratch your head. I won't. You look all right. So do you. You also look nervous. And Selden said wryly, Guess why? Doors reached out impulsively and squeezed Harry's hand, then drew back as if surprised at herself. Looking down, she straightened her white kirtle. Harry, himself a trifle surprised and peculiarly pleased, cleared his throat and said, Okay, let's go. Airy Robot a term used in the ancient legends of several worlds for what are more usually called automata. Robots are described as generally human in shape and made of metal, although some are supposed to have been pseudo-organic in nature. Harry Selden, in the course of the flight, is popularly supposed to have seen an actual robot, but that story is of dubious origin. Nowhere in Selden's voluminous writings does he mention robots at all, although... Encyclopedia Galactica. 
56. They were not noticed. Harry Selden and Doris Van Avely repeated the trip of the day before, and this time no one gave them a second look. Hardly anyone even gave them a first look. On several occasions they had to tuck their knees to one side to allow someone sitting on an inner seat to get past them and out. When someone got in, they quickly realized they had to move over if there was an inner empty seat. This time they quickly grew tired of the smell of kirtles that were not freshly laundered because they were not so easily diverted by what went on outside. But eventually they were there. That's the library, said Selden in a low voice. I suppose so, said Doors. At least that's the building that Mycelium 72 pointed out yesterday. They sauntered toward it leisurely. Take a deep breath, said Selden. This is the first hurdle. The door ahead was open, the light within subdued. There were five broad stone steps leading upward. They stepped onto the lowermost one and waited several moments before they realized that their weight did not cause the steps to move upward. Doris grimaced very slightly and gestured Selden upward. Together they walked up the stairs, feeling embarrassed on behalf of Mycogen for its backwardness. Then, through a door, where, at a desk immediately inside, was a man bent over the simplest and clumsiest computer Selden had ever seen. The man did not look up at them. No need, Selden supposed. White kirtle, bald head. All Mycogenians looked so nearly the same that one's eyes slid off them, and that was to the tribespeople's advantage at the moment. The man, who still seemed to be studying something on the desk, said, Scholars? Scholars, said Selden. The man jerked his head toward a door. Go in. Enjoy. They moved inward, and as nearly as they could see, they were the only ones in this section of the library. Either the library was not a popular resort, or the scholars were few, or most likely, both. Selden whispered, I thought surely we would have to present some sort of license or permission form, and I would have to plead having forgotten it. He probably welcomes our presence under any terms. Did you ever see a place like this? If a place like a person could be dead we would be inside a corpse. Most of the books in this section were print books, like the book in Selden's inner pocket. Doris drifted along the shelves, studying them. She said, Old books, for the most part, part classic, part worthless. Outside books? Non-mycogen, I mean? Oh, yes. If they have their own books, they must be kept in another section. This one is for outside research, for poor little self-styled scholars like yesterday's. This is the reference department. And here's an imperial encyclopedia. Must be fifty years old if a day. And a computer. She reached for the keys, and Selden stopped her. Wait. Something could go wrong, and we'll be delayed. He pointed to a discreet sign above a freestanding set of shelves that glowed with the letters, To the Sacratorium. The second A in Sacratorium was dead, possibly recently, or possibly because no one cared. The Empire, thought Selden, was in decay, all parts of it, mycogen too. He looked about. The poor library, so necessary to Mycogenian pride, perhaps so useful to the elders who could use it to find crumbs to shore up their own beliefs and present them as being those of sophisticated tribespeople, seemed to be completely empty. No one had entered after them. Selden said, Let's step in here, out of eyeshot of the man at the door, and put on our sashes. And then at the door... Aware suddenly there would be no turning back if they passed this second hurdle, he said, Doors, 
Don't come in with me. She frowned. Why not? It's not safe, and I don't want you to be at risk. I am here to protect you, she said with soft firmness. What kind of protection can you be? I can protect myself, though you may not think it, and I'd be handicapped by having to protect you, don't you see that? You mustn't be concerned about me, Harry, said Doors. Concern is my part. She tapped her sash where it crossed in the space between her obscured breasts. Because Haman asked you to. Because those are my orders. She seized Selden's arms just above his elbow, and as always he was surprised by her firm grip. She said, I'm against this, Harry, but if you feel you must go in, then I must go in too. All right, then. But if anything happens and you can wriggle out of it, run. Don't worry about me. You're wasting your breath, Harry, and you're insulting me. Selden touched the entrance panel, and the portal slid open. Together, almost in unison, they walked through. 57. A large room, all the larger because it was empty of anything resembling furniture. No chairs, no benches, no seats of any kind. No stage, no drapery, no decorations. No lights, merely a uniform illumination of mild, unfocused light. The walls were not entirely blank. Periodically, arranged in spaced fashion at various heights and in no easy repetitive order, there were small, primitive, two-dimensional television screens, all of which were operating. From where Doris and Selden stood, there was not even the illusion of a third dimension, not a breath of true holovision. There were people present, not many, and nowhere together. They stood singly, and like the television monitors, in no easy repetitive order. All were white-kirtled, all sashed. For the most part, there was silence. No one talked in the usual sense. Some moved their lips, murmuring softly. Those who walked did so stealthily, eyes downcast. The atmosphere was absolutely funereal. Selden leaned toward Doors, who instantly put a finger to her lips, then pointed to one of the television monitors. The screen showed an idyllic garden bursting with blooms, the camera panning over it slowly. They walked toward the monitor in a fashion that imitated the others. Slow steps, putting each foot down softly. When they were within half a meter of the screen, a soft, insinuating voice made itself heard. The Garden of Antenin, as reproduced from ancient guidebooks and photographs, located in the outskirts of Eos. Note the... Doris said in a whisper Selden had trouble catching over the sound of the set. It turns on when someone is close, and it will turn off if we step away. If we're close enough, we can talk under cover, but don't look at me, and stop speaking if anyone approaches. Selden, his head bent, his hands clasped before him, he had noted that this was a preferred posture, said... Any moment I expect someone to start wailing. Someone might. They're mourning their lost world, said Doris. I hope they change the films every once in a while. It would be deadly to always see the same ones. They're all different, said Doris, her eyes sliding this way and that. They may change periodically. I don't know. Wait, said Selden, just a hair's breadth too loud. He lowered his voice and said, Come this way. Doors frowned, failing to make out the words, 
but Selden gestured slightly with his head. Again, the stealthy walk. But Selden's footsteps increased in length as he felt the need for greater speed, and doors catching up pulled sharply, if very briefly, at his kirtle. He slowed. Robots here, he said under the cover of the sound as it came on. The picture showed the corner of a dwelling place with a rolling lawn and a line of hedges in the foreground, and three of what could only be described as robots. They were metallic, apparently, and vaguely human in shape. The recording said, This is a view, recently constructed, of the establishment of the famous Wendome estate of the third century. The robot you see near the center was, according to tradition, named Bendar, and served 22 years according to the ancient records before being replaced. Doris said, Recently constructed, so they must change views. Unless they've been saying recently constructed for the last thousand years. Another Mycogenian stepped into the sound pattern of the scene and said in a low voice, though not as low as the whisperings of Selden and Doors, Greetings, brothers. He did not look at Selden and Doors as he spoke, and after one involuntary and startled glance, Selden kept his head averted. Doris had ignored it all. Selden hesitated. Mycelium 72 had said that there was no talking in the sacratorium. Perhaps he had exaggerated. Then, too, he had not been in the sacratorium since he was a child. Desperately, Selden decided he must speak. He said in a whisper, And to you, brother, greetings. He had no idea whether that was the correct formula of reply, or if there was a formula, but the Mycogenian seemed to find nothing amiss in it. To you in Aurora, he said. And to you, said Selden. And because it seemed to him that the other expected more, he added, in Aurora. And there was an impalpable release of tension. Selden felt his forehead growing moist. The Mycogenian said, Beautiful. I haven't seen this before. Skillfully done, said Selden. Then, in a burst of daring, he added, A loss never to be forgotten. The other seemed startled, then said, Indeed, indeed, and moved away. Doors hissed, Take no chances. Don't say what you don't have to. It seemed natural. Anyway, this is recent. But those are disappointing robots. They are what I would expect Automata to be. I want to see the organic ones, the humanoids. If they existed, said Doris with some hesitation, it seems to me they wouldn't be used for gardening jobs. True, said Selden. We must find the elders airy. If that exists, it seems to me there is nothing in this hollow cave but a hollow cave. Let's look. They paced along the wall, passing from screen to screen, trying to wait at each for irregular intervals until Doris clutched Selden's arms. Between two screens were lines marking out a faint rectangle. A door, Doris said. Then she weakened the assertion by adding, Do you think? Selden looked about surreptitiously. It was in the highest degree convenient that, in keeping with the morning atmosphere, every face, when not fixed on a television monitor, was bent in sad concentration on the floor. Selden said, How do you suppose it would open? An entrance patch. I can't make out any. It's just not marked out. But there's a slight discoloration there. Do you see it? How many palms? How many times? 
I'll try. Keep an eye out and kick me if anyone looks in this direction. He held his breath casually, touched the discolored spot to no avail, and then placed his palm full upon it and pressed. The door opened silently. Not a creak, not a scrape. Selden stepped through as rapidly as he could, and Doris followed him. The door closed behind them. The question is, said Doris, did anyone see us? Selden said, Elders must go through this door frequently. Yes, but will anyone think we are elders? Selden waited, then said, If we were observed, and if anyone thought something was wrong, this door would have been flung open again within fifteen seconds of our entering. Possibly, said Doris dryly, or possibly there is nothing to be seen or done on this side of the door, and no one cares if we enter. That remains to be seen, muttered Selden. The rather narrow room they had entered was somewhat dark, but as they stepped farther into it, the light brightened. There were chairs, wide and comfortable, small tables, several Davenports, a deep and tall refrigerator, cupboards. If this is the elders' airy, said Selden, the elders seem to do themselves comfortably, despite the austerity of the sacratorium itself. As would be expected, said Doris. Asceticism among a ruling class, except for public show, is very rare. Put that down in your notebook for psychohistorical aphorisms. She looked about. And there is no robot. Selden said, An airy is a high position, remember, and this ceiling is not. There must be upper stories, and that must be the way. He pointed to a well-carpeted stairway. He did not advance toward it, however, but looked about vaguely. Doris guessed what he was seeking. She said, Forget about elevators. There's a cult of primitivism in mycogen. Surely you haven't forgotten that, have you? There would be no elevators. And what's more, if we place our weight at the foot of the stairs, I am quite certain it will not begin moving upward. We're going to have to climb it. Several flights, perhaps. Climb it? It must, in the nature of things, lead to the airy, if it leads anywhere. Do you want to see the airy, or don't you? Together they stepped toward the staircase and began the climb. They went up three flights, and as they did, the light level decreased perceptibly and in steady increments. Selden took a deep breath and whispered, I consider myself to be in pretty good shape, but I hate this. You're not used to this precise type of physical exertion. She showed no signs of physical distress, whatever. At the top of the third flight, the stairs ended, and before them was another door. And if it's locked, said Selden, more to himself than to Doris, do we try to break it down? But Doris said, Why should it be locked when the lower door was not? If this is the elders' airy, I imagine there's a taboo on anyone but elders coming here, and a taboo is much stronger than any lock. As far as those who accept the taboo are concerned, said Selden. But he made no move toward the door. There's still time to turn back since you hesitate, said Doors. In fact, I would advise you to turn back. I only hesitate because I don't know what we'll find inside. If it's empty. And then he added in a rather louder voice, then it's empty. And he strode forward and pushed against the entry panel. The door retracted with silent speed, and Selden took a step back at the surprising flood of light from within. And there, facing him, eyes alive with light, arms half upraised, 
one foot slightly advanced before the other, gleaming with a faintly yellow metallic shine, was a human figure. For a few moments it seemed to be wearing a tight-fitting tunic, but on closer inspection it became apparent that the tunic was part of the structure of the object. It's the robot, said Selden in awe, but it's metallic. Worse than that, said Doors, who had stepped quickly to one side and then to the other, its eyes don't follow me. Its arms don't as much as tremble. It's not alive, if one can speak of robots as being alive. And a man, unmistakably a man, stepped out from behind the robot and said, Perhaps not, but I am alive. And almost automatically, Doris stepped forward and took her place between Selden and the man who had suddenly appeared. 58. Selden pushed Doris to one side, perhaps a shade more roughly than he intended. I don't need protection. This is our old friend Sunmaster Fourteen. The man who faced them, wearing a double sash that was perhaps his right as High Elder, said, And you are tribesman Selden. Of course, said Selden. And this, despite her masculine dress, is tribeswoman Benabali. Doris said nothing. Sunmaster Fourteen said, You are right, of course, tribesman. You are in no danger of physical harm from me. Please sit down. Both of you. Since you are not a sister, tribeswoman, you need not retire. There is a seat for you, which, if you value such a distinction, you will be the first woman ever to have used. I do not value such a distinction, said Doris, spacing her words for emphasis. Sunmaster Fourteen nodded. That is as you wish. I too will sit down, for I must ask you questions, and I do not care to do it standing. They were sitting now in a corner of the room. Selden's eyes wandered to the metal robot. Sunmaster Fourteen said, It is a robot. I know, said Selden briefly. I know you do, said Sunmaster Fourteen with similar curtness. But now that we have settled that matter, why are you here? Selden gazed steadily at Sunmaster Fourteen and said, To see the robot. Do you know that no one but an elder is allowed in the airy? I did not know that, but I suspected it. Do you know that no tribesperson is allowed in the sacratorium? I was told that. And you ignored the fact, is that it? As I said, we wanted to see the robot. Do you know that no woman, even a sister, is allowed in the sacratorium except at certain stated and rare occasions? I was told that. And do you know that no woman is at any time, or for any reason, allowed to dress in masculine garb? That holds within the borders of mycogen for tribeswomen as well as for sisters. I was not told that, but I am not surprised. Good. I want you to understand all this. Now why did you want to see the robot? Selden said with a shrug, Curiosity. I had never seen a robot, or even known that such a thing existed. And how did you come to know that it did exist, and specifically that it existed here? Selden was silent, then said, I do not wish to answer that question. Is that why you were brought to Mycogen by tribesman Hummin to investigate robots? No. Tribesman Hummin brought us here that we might be secure. However, we are scholars, Dr. Van Abilie and I. Knowledge is our province, and to gain knowledge is our purpose. 
Mycogen is little understood outside its borders, and we wish to know more about your ways and your methods of thought. It is a natural desire, and it seems to us a harmless, even praiseworthy one. Ah, but we do not wish the outer tribes and worlds to know about us. That is our natural desire. And we are the judge of what is harmless to us and what harmful. So I ask you again, tribesmen, how did you know that a robot existed in Mycogen and that it existed in this room? General Rumor, said Selden at length. Do you insist on that? General Rumor, I insist on it. Sunmaster Fourteen's keen blue eyes seemed to sharpen, and he said without raising his voice, Tribesman Selden, we have long cooperated with Tribesman Hummin. For a tribesman, he has seemed a decent and trustworthy individual. For a tribesman. When he brought you two to us and commended you to our protection, we granted it. But Tribesman Hummin, whatever his virtues, is still a tribesman, and we had misgivings. We were not at all sure what your or his real purpose might be. Our purpose was knowledge, said Selden, academic knowledge. Tribeswoman Venabili is a historian, and I too have an interest in history. Why should we not be interested in Mycogenian history? For one thing, because we do not wish you to be. In any case, two of our trusted sisters were sent to you, they were to cooperate with you, try to find out what it was you wanted, and, what is the expression you tribesmen use, play along with you, yet not in such a way that you would be too aware as to what was happening. Sunmaster Fourteen smiled, but it was a grim smile. Raindrop Forty-Five, Sunmaster Fourteen went on, went shopping with tribeswoman Venabili, but there seemed nothing out of the way in what happened on those trips. Naturally, we had a full report. Raindrop 43 showed you, tribesman Selden, our microfarms. You might have been suspicious of her willingness to accompany you alone, something that is utterly out of the question for us, but you reasoned that what applied to brothers did not apply to tribesmen and you flattered yourself that that flimsy bit of reasoning won her over. She complied with your desire, though at considerable cost to her peace of mind. And eventually you asked for the book. To have handed it over too easily might have roused your suspicion. So she pretended to a perverse desire only you could satisfy. Her self-sacrifice will not be forgotten. I take it, tribesmen, you still have the book, and I suspect you have it with you now. May I have it? Selden sat in bitter silence. Sunmaster Fourteen's wrinkled hand remained obtrusively outstretched, and he said, How much better it would be than to wrest it from you by force. And Selden handed it over. Sunmaster Fourteen leafed through its pages briefly, as though to reassure himself it was unharmed. He said with a small sigh, It will have to be carefully destroyed in the approved manner. Sad. But once you had this book, we were of course not surprised when you made your way out to the Sacratorium. You were watched at all times for you cannot think that any brother or sister, not totally absorbed, would not recognize you for tribespeople at a glance. We know a skin cap when we see one, and there are less than seventy of them in Mycogen, almost all belonging to tribesmen on official business who remain entirely in secular governmental buildings during the time they are here. So you were not only seen, but unmistakably identified, over and over. The elderly brother who met you 
was careful to tell you about the library as well as about the sacratorium. But he was also careful to tell you what you were forbidden to do, for we did not wish to entrap you. Skystrip, too, also warned you, and quite forcibly. Nevertheless, you did not turn away. The shop at which you bought the white kirtle and the two sashes informed us at once, and from that we knew well what you intended. The library was kept empty. The librarian was warned to keep his eyes to himself. The sacratorium was kept underutilized. The one brother who inadvertently spoke to you almost gave it away, but hastened off when he realized with whom he was dealing. And then you came up here. You see then that it was your intention to come up here, and that we in no way lured you here. You came as a result of your own action, your own desire. And what I want to ask you, yet once again, is, why? It was Doors who answered this time, her voice firm, her eyes hard. We will tell you yet once again, my Cogenian. We are scholars who consider knowledge sacred, and it is only knowledge that we seek. You did not lure us here, but you did not stop us either, as you might have done before ever we approached this building. You smoothed our way and made it easy for us, and even that might be considered a lure. And what harm have we done? We have in no way disturbed the building, or this room, or you, or that. She pointed to the robot. It is a dead lump of metal that you hide here, and we now know that it is dead, and that is all the knowledge we sought. We thought it would be more significant, and we are disappointed. But now that we know it is merely what it is, we will leave. And, if you wish, we will leave mycogen as well. Sunmaster Fourteen listened with no trace of expression on his face. But when she was done, he addressed Selden, saying, This robot, as you see it, is a symbol. A symbol of all we have lost, and of all we no longer have. Of all that, through thousands of years, we have not forgotten, and what we intend some day to return to, because it is all that remains to us that is both material and authentic, it is dear to us. Yet to your woman it is only a dead lump of metal. Do you associate yourself with that judgment, tridesman Selden? Selden said, we are members of societies that do not tie ourselves to a past that is thousands of years old, making no contact at all with what has existed between that past and ourselves. We live in the present, which we recognize as the product of all the past, and not of one long-gone moment of time that we hug to our chests. We realize intellectually what the robot may mean to you, and we are willing to let it continue to mean that to you. But we can only see it with our own eyes, as you can only see it with yours. To us it is a dead lump of metal. And now, said Doris, we will leave. You will not, said Sunmaster Fourteen. By coming here you have committed a crime. It is a crime only in our eyes, as you will hasten to point out. His lips curved in a wintry smile. But this is our territory, and within it we make the definitions. And this crime, as we define it, is punishable by death. And you are going to shoot us down, said Doris haughtily. Sunmaster Fourteen's expression was one of contempt, and he continued to speak only to Selden. What do you think we are, tribesman Selden? Our culture is as old as yours, as complex, as civilized, as humane. I am not armed. You will be tried, 
and since you are manifestly guilty, executed according to law, quickly and painlessly. If you were to try to leave now, I would not stop you. But there are many brothers below, many more than there appeared to be when you entered the sacratorium. And in their rage at your action, they may lay rough and forceful hands on you. It has happened in our history that tribes' people have even died so, and it is not a pleasant death. Certainly not a painless one. We were warned of this, said Doors, by Skystrip too. So much for your complex, civilized, and humane culture. People can be moved to violence at moments of emotion, tribesman Selden said Sun Master Fourteen calmly, whatever their humanity in moments of calm. This is true in every culture, as your woman, who is said to be a historian, must surely know. Selden said, Let us remain reasonable, Sun Master Fourteen. You may be the law in Mycogen over local affairs, but you are not the law over us, and you know it. We are both non-Mycogenian citizens of the Empire, and it is the Emperor and his designated legal officers who must remain in charge of any capital offense. Sunmaster Fourteen said, That may be so in statutes and on papers and on holovision screens, but we are not talking theory now. The High Elder has long had the power to punish crimes of sacrilege without interference from the imperial throne. If the criminals are your own people, said Selden, it would be quite different if they were outsiders. I doubt it in this case. Tribesman Hummin brought you here as fugitives, and we are not so yeast-headed in mycogen that we don't strongly suspect that you are fugitives from the emperor's laws. Why should he object if we do his work for him? Because, said Selden, he would. Even if we were fugitives from the imperial authorities, and even if he wanted us only to punish us, he would still want us. To allow you to kill, by whatever means and for whatever reason, non-Mycogenians, without due imperial process, would be to defy his authority, and no emperor could allow such a precedent. No matter how eager he might be to see that the microfood trade not be interrupted, he would still feel it necessary to re-establish the imperial prerogative. Do you wish, in your eagerness to kill us, to have a division of imperial soldiery loot your farms and your dwellings, desecrate your sacratorium, and take liberties with the sisters? Consider. Sunmaster Fourteen smiled once again, but displayed no softness. Actually, I have considered, and there is an alternative. After we condemn you, we could delay your execution to allow you to appeal to the Emperor for a review of your case. The Emperor might be grateful at this evidence of our ready submission to his authority, and grateful, too, to lay his hands on you, too, for some reason of his own, and Mycogen might profit. Is that what you want, then? To appeal to the Emperor in due course, and to be delivered to him? Selden and Doris looked at each other briefly, and were silent. Sunmaster Fourteen said, I feel you would rather be delivered to the Emperor than die. But why do I get the impression that the preference is only by a slight margin? Actually, said a new voice, I think neither alternative is acceptable, and that we must search for a third. 59. It was Doris who identified the newcomer first, perhaps because it was she who expected him. Hummin, she said. Thank goodness you found us. I got in touch with you the moment I realized I was not going to deflect Harry from... She held up her hands in a wide gesture. This. 
Hummond's smile was a small one that did not alter the natural gravity of his face. There was a subtle wariness about him. My dear, he said, I was engaged in other things. I cannot always pull away at a moment's notice. And when I got here, I had, like you two, to supply myself with a kirtle and sash, to say nothing of a skin cap, and make my way out here. Had I been here earlier, I might have stopped this. But I believe I'm not too late. Sunmaster Fourteen had recovered from what had seemed to be a painful shock. He said, in a voice that lacked its customary severe depth, How did you get in here, Tribesman Hummin? It was not easy, High Elder, but as Tribeswoman Venabili likes to say, I am a very persuasive person. Some of the citizens here remembered who I was, and what I have done for Mycogen in the past, that I am even an honorary brother. Have you forgotten, Sun Master Fourteen? The elder replied, I have not forgotten, but even the most favorable memory cannot survive certain actions. A tribesman here, and a tribeswoman. There is no greater crime. All you have done is not great enough to balance that. My people are not unmindful. We will make it up to you some other way. But these two must die or be handed over to the Emperor. I am also here, said Haman calmly. Is that not a crime as well? For you, said Sunmaster Fourteen, for you personally, as a kind of honorary brother, I can overlook it once, not these two. Because you expect a reward from the Emperor, some favor, some concession, have you already been in touch with him or with his chief of staff, Ato Demerzel, more likely? That is not the subject for discussion. Which is itself an admission. Come on, I don't ask what the Emperor promised, but it cannot be much. He does not have much to give in these degenerate days. Let me make you an offer. Have these two told you they are scholars? They have. And they are. They are not lying. The tribeswoman is a historian, and the tribesman is a mathematician. The two together are trying to combine their talents to make a mathematics of history, and they call the combined subject psychohistory. Sunmaster Fourteen said, I know nothing about this psychohistory, nor do I care to know. Neither it nor any other facet of your tribal learning interests me. Nevertheless, said Haman, I suggest that you listen to me. It took Haman some fifteen minutes, speaking concisely, to describe the possibility of organizing the natural laws of society, something he always mentioned with audible quotation marks in the tone of his voice, in such a way as to make it possible to anticipate the future with a substantial degree of probability. And when he was done, Sun Master Fourteen, who had listened expressionlessly, said, A highly unlikely piece of speculation, I should say. Selden, with a rueful expression, seemed about to speak, undoubtedly to agree. But Hummond's hand, resting lightly on the other's knee, tightened unmistakably. Hummond said, Possibly, High Elder, but the Emperor doesn't think so. And by the Emperor, who is himself an amiable enough personage, I really mean Demerzel, concerning whose ambitions you need no instruction. They would like very much to have these two scholars, which is why I've brought them here for safekeeping. I had little expectation that you would do Demerzel's work for him by delivering the scholars to him. They have committed a crime that... Yes, we know, High Elder, but it is only a crime because you choose to call it so. No real harm has been done. 
it has been done to our belief, to our deepest felt. But imagine what harm will be done if psychohistory falls into the hands of Demerzel. Yes, I grant that nothing may come of it. But suppose for a moment that something does, and that the imperial government has the use of it, can foretell what is to come, can take measures with that foreknowledge which no one else would have, can take measures, in fact, designed to bring about an alternate future more to the imperial liking. Well? Is there any doubt, High Elder, that the alternate future more to the imperial liking would be one of tightened centralization? For centuries now, as you very well know, the Empire has been undergoing a steady decentralization. Many worlds now acknowledge only lip service to the Emperor and virtually rule themselves. Even here on Trantor there is decentralization. Mycogen, as only one example, is free of imperial interference for the most part. You rule as High Elder, and there is no imperial officer at your side overseeing your actions and decisions. How long do you think that will last with men like Demerzel adjusting the future to their liking? Still the flimsiest of speculation, said Sunmaster Fourteen, but a disturbing one. I admit. On the other hand, if these scholars can complete their task, an unlikely if, you might say, but an if, then they are sure to remember that you spared them when you might have chosen not to. And it would then be conceivable that they would learn to arrange a future, for instance, that would allow Mycogen to be given a world of its own a world that could be terraformed into a close replica of the lost world. And even if these two forget your kindness, I will be here to remind them. Well, said Sunmaster Fourteen. Come on, said Hummin. It is not hard to decide what must be going through your mind. Of all tribespeople, you must trust Demerzel the least. And though the chance of psychohistory might be small, if I was not being honest with you, I would not admit that, it is not zero. And if it will bring about a restoration of the lost world, what can you want more than that? What would you not risk for even a tiny chance of that? Come now, I promise you, and my promises are not lightly given. Release these two and choose a tiny chance of your heart's desire over no chance at all. There was silence, and then Sunmaster Fourteen sighed. I don't know how it is, Tribesman Hummin, but on every occasion that we meet, you persuade me into something I do not really want to do. Have I ever misled you, High Elder? You have never offered me so small a chance. And so high a possible reward. The one balances the other. And Sunmaster Fourteen nodded his head. You are right. Take these two, and take them out of Mycogen, and never let me see them again, unless there comes a time when... But... Surely it will not be in my lifetime. Perhaps not, High Elder. But your people have been waiting patiently for nearly twenty thousand years. Would you then object to waiting another, perhaps, two hundred? I would not willingly wait one moment, but my people will wait as long as they must. And standing up, he said, I will clear the path. Take them and go. Sixty. They were finally back in a tunnel. Hummin and Selden had traveled through one when they went from the Imperial Sector to Streeling University in the air taxi. Now they were in another tunnel, going from Mycogen to... Selden did not know where. He hesitated to ask. 
Humman's face seemed as if it was carved out of granite, and it didn't welcome conversation. Humman sat in the front of the four-seater, with no one to his right. Selden and Doris shared the back seat. Selden chanced to smile at Doris, who looked glum. It's nice to be in real clothes again, isn't it? I will never, said Doris with enormous sincerity, wear or look at anything that resembles a kirtle. And I will never, under any circumstances, wear a skin cap. In fact, I'm going to feel odd if I ever see a normally bald man. And it was Doris who finally asked the question that Selden had been reluctant to advance. Chetter, she said rather petulantly, why won't you tell us where we're going? Humman hitched himself into a sideways position, and he looked back at Doris and Selden gravely. Somewhere, he said, where it may be difficult for you to get into trouble, although I'm not sure such a place exists. Doris was at once crestfallen. Actually, Chetter, it's my fault. At Streeling I let Harry go upper side without accompanying him. In Mycogen I at least accompanied him, but I suppose I ought not to have let him enter the sacratorium at all. I was determined, said Selden warmly. It was in no way Doris's fault. Humman made no effort to apportion blame. He simply said, I gather you wanted to see the robot. Was there a reason for that? Can you tell me? Selden could feel himself redden. I was wrong in that respect, Humman. I did not see what I expected to see, or what I hoped to see. If I had known the content of the airy, I would never have bothered going there. Call it a complete fiasco. But then, Selden, what was it you hoped to see? Please tell me. Take your time if you wish. This is a long trip, and I am willing to listen. The thing is, Humman, that I had the idea that there were humaniform robots, that they were long-lived, that at least one might still be alive, and that it might be in the airy. There was a robot there, but it was metallic. It was dead, and it was merely a symbol. Had I but known? Yes, did we all but know there would be no need for questions or for research of any kind? Where did you get your information about humaniform robots? Since no mycogenian would have discussed that with you, I can think of only one source, the mycogenian book, a powered print book in ancient Auroran and modern galactic, am I right? Yes. And how did you get a copy? Selden paused, then muttered, It's somewhat embarrassing. I am not easily embarrassed, Selden. Selden told him, and Humman allowed a very small smile to twitch across his face. Humman said, Didn't it occur to you that what occurred had to be a charade? No sister would do a thing like that, except under instruction, and with a great deal of persuading. Selden frowned and said with asperity, that was not at all obvious. People are perverted now and then. And it's easy for you to grin. I didn't have the information you had, and neither did Doors. If you did not wish me to fall into traps, you might have warned me of those that existed. I agree. I withdraw my remark. In any case, you don't have the book any longer, I'm sure. No. No. Sunmaster Fourteen took it from me. How much of it did you read? Only a small fraction. I didn't have time. It's a huge book, and I must tell you, Humman, it is dreadfully dull. Yes, I know that, for I think I have read more of it than you have. It is not only dull, 
it is totally unreliable. It is a one-sided, official, mycogenian view of history that is more intent on presenting that view than a reasoned objectivity. It is even deliberately unclear in spots, so that outsiders, even if they were to read the book, would never know entirely what they read. What was it, for instance, that you thought you read about robots that interested you? I've already told you. They speak of humaniform robots, robots that could not be distinguished from human beings in outward appearance. How many of these would exist? asked Tumman. They don't say. At least, I didn't come across a passage in which they gave numbers. There may have been only a handful, but one of them, the book refers to as Renegade. It seems to have an unpleasant significance, but I couldn't make out what. You didn't tell me anything about that, interposed Doors. If you had, I would have told you that it's not a proper name. It's another archaic word, and it means, roughly, what traitor would mean in galactic. The older word has a greater aura of fear about it. A traitor somehow sneaks to his treason, but a renegade flaunts it. Hummin said, I'll leave the fine points of archaic language to you, Doors, but in any case, if the renegade actually existed, and if it was a humaniform robot, then clearly, as a traitor and enemy, it would not be preserved and venerated in the elder's airy. Selden said, I didn't know the meaning of renegade, but as I said, I did get the impression that it was an enemy. I thought it might have been defeated and preserved as a reminder of the Mycogenian triumph. Was there any indication in the book that the renegade was defeated? No, but I might have missed that portion. Not likely. Any Mycogenian victory would be announced in the book unmistakably and referred to over and over again. There was another point the book made about the renegade, said Selden, hesitating. But I can't be at all sure I understood it. Hummon said, As I told you, they are deliberately obscure at times. Nevertheless, they seemed to say that the renegade could somehow tap human emotions, influence them. Any politician can, said Hummond with a shrug. It's called charisma, but it works. Selden sighed. Well, I wanted to believe. That was it. I would have given a great deal to find an ancient humaniform robot that was still alive and that I could question. For what purpose? asked Tumman. To learn the details of the primordial galactic society when it still consisted of only a handful of worlds. From so small a galaxy, psychohistory could be deduced more easily. Hummond said, are you sure you could trust what you heard? After many thousands of years, would you be willing to rely on the robot's early memories? How much distortion would have entered into them? That's right, said Dora suddenly. It would be like the computerized records I told you of, Harry. Slowly, those robot memories would be discarded, lost, erased, distorted. You can only go back so far, and the farther you go back, the less reliable the information becomes, no matter what you do. Hummond nodded. I've heard it referred to as a kind of uncertainty principle in information. But wouldn't it be possible, said Selden thoughtfully, that some information for special reasons would be preserved? Parts of the Mycogenian book may well refer to events of 20,000 years ago, and yet be very largely as it had been originally. The more valued and the more carefully preserved particular information is, the more long-lasting and accurate it may be. The key word is particular. 
What the book may care to preserve may not be what you wish to have preserved, and what a robot may remember best may be what you wish him to remember least. Selden said in despair, In whatever direction I turn to seek a way of working out psychohistory, matters so arrange themselves as to make it impossible. Why bother trying? It might seem hopeless now, said Hummon unemotionally, but given the necessary genius, a route to psychohistory may be found that none of us would at this moment expect. Give yourself more time. But we're coming to a rest area. Let us pull off and have dinner. Over the lamb patties on rather tasteless bread, most unpalatable after the fare at Mycogen, Selden said, You seem to assume, Hummon, that I am the possessor of the necessary genius. I may not be, you know. Hummon said, That's true. You may not be. However, I know of no alternate candidate for the post, so I must cling to you. And Selden sighed and said, Well, I'll try, but I'm out of any spark of hope. Possible, but not practical, I said to begin with, and I'm more convinced of that now than I ever was before. Heat Sink Amaril, Hugo, a mathematician who, next to Harry Selden himself, may be considered most responsible for working out the details of psychohistory. It was he who... Yet the conditions under which he began life are almost more dramatic than his mathematical accomplishments. Born into the hopeless poverty of the lower classes of Dahl, a sector of ancient Trantor, he might have passed his life in utter obscurity, were it not for the fact that Selden, quite by accident, encountered him in the course of Encyclopedia Galactica. 61. The Emperor of all the galaxy felt weary, physically weary. His lips ached from the gracious smile he had had to place on his face at careful intervals. His neck was stiff from having inclined his head this way and that in a feigned show of interest. His ears pained from having to listen. His whole body throbbed from having to rise and to sit and to turn and to hold out his hand and to nod. It was merely a state function where one had to meet mayors and viceroys and ministers and their wives or husbands from here and there in Trantor, and worse, from here and there in the galaxy. There were nearly a thousand present, all in costumes that varied from the ornate to the downright outlandish, and he had had to listen to a babble of different accents, made the worse by an effort to speak the emperor's galactic, as spoken at the Galactic University. Worst of all, the Emperor had had to remember to avoid making commitments of substance while freely applying the lotion of words without substance. All had been recorded, sight and sound, very discreetly, and Ato Demerzel would go over it to see if Cleon, first of that name, had behaved himself. That, of course, was only the way that the Emperor put it to himself. Demerzel would surely say that he was merely collecting data on any unintentional self-revelation on the part of the guests. And perhaps he was. Fortunate Demerzel. The Emperor could not leave the palace and its extensive grounds, while Demerzel could range the galaxy if he wished. The Emperor was always on display always accessible, always forced to deal with visitors, from the important to the merely intrusive. Demerzel remained anonymous and never allowed himself to be seen inside the palace grounds. He remained merely a fearsome name and an invisible and therefore the more frightening presence. The emperor was the inside man with all the trappings and emoluments of power. Demerzel was the outside man, with nothing evident, 
not even a formal title, but with his fingers and mind probing everywhere and asking for no reward for his tireless labors but one, the reality of power. It amused the emperor in a macabre sort of way to consider that at any moment, without warning, with a manufactured excuse or with none at all, he could have Demerzel arrested, imprisoned, exiled, tortured, or executed. After all, in these annoying centuries of constant unrest, the emperor might have difficulty in exerting his will over the various planets of the empire, even over the various sectors of Trantor, with their rabble of local executives and legislatures that he was forced to deal with in a maze of interlocking decrees, protocols, commitments, treaties, and general interstellar legalities. But at least his powers remained absolute over the palace and its grounds. And yet Cleon knew that his dreams of power were useless. Demerzel had served his father, and Cleon could not remember a time when he did not turn to Demerzel for everything. It was Demerzel who knew it all, devised it all, did it all. More than that, it was on Demerzel that anything that went wrong could be blamed. The emperor himself remained above criticism and had nothing to fear. Except, of course, palace coups and assassination by his nearest and dearest. It was to prevent this above all that he depended upon Demerzel. Emperor Cleon felt a tiny shudder at the thought of trying to do without Demerzel. There had been emperors who had ruled personally, who had had a series of chiefs of staff of no talent, who had had incompetence serving in the post and had kept them, and somehow they had gotten along for a time and after a fashion. But Cleon could not. He needed Demerzel. In fact, now that the thought of assassination had come to him, and in view of the modern history of the Empire, it was inevitable that it had come to him. He could see that getting rid of Demerzel was quite impossible. It couldn't be done. No matter how cleverly he, Cleon, would attempt to arrange it, Demerzel, he was sure, would anticipate the move somehow, would know it was on its way, and would arrange with far superior cleverness a palace coup. Cleon would be dead before Demerzel could possibly be taken away in chains, and there would simply be another emperor that Demerzel would serve and dominate. Or would Demerzel tire of the game and make himself emperor? Never. The habit of anonymity was too strong in him. If Demerzel exposed himself to the world, then his powers, his wisdom, his luck, whatever it was, would surely desert him. Cleon was convinced of that. He felt it to be beyond dispute. So, while he behaved himself, Cleon was safe. With no ambitions of his own, Demerzel would serve him faithfully. And now here was Demerzel, dressed so severely and simply that it made Cleon uneasily conscious of the useless ornamentation of his robes of state, now thankfully removed with the aid of two valets. Naturally, it would not be until he was alone and in dishabille that Demerzel would glide into view. Demerzel said the emperor of all the galaxy. I am tired. State functions are tiring, sire, murmured Demoiselle. Then must I have them every evening? Not every evening, but they are essential. It gratifies others to see you and to be taken note of by you. It helps keep the empire running smoothly. The empire used to be kept running smoothly by power, said the emperor somberly. Now it must be kept running by a smile, a wave of the hand, a murmured word, and a medal or a plaque. If all that keeps the peace, sire, there is much to be said for it, and your reign proceeds well. You know why, because I have you at my side. My only real gift is that I am aware of your importance. 
He looked at Demerzel slyly. My son need not be my heir. He is not a talented boy. What if I make you my heir? Demerzel said freezingly, Sire, that is unthinkable. I would not usurp the throne. I would not steal it from your rightful heir. Besides, if I have displeased you, punish me justly. Surely nothing I have done or could possibly do deserves the punishment of being made emperor. Cleon laughed. For that true assessment of the value of the imperial throne, Demerzel, I abandon any thought of punishing you. Come now, let us talk about something. I would sleep, but I am not yet ready for the ceremonies with which they put me to bed. Let us talk. About what, sire? About anything. About that mathematician and his psychohistory. I think about him every once in a while, you know. I thought of him at dinner tonight. I wondered, what if a psychohistorical analysis would predict a method for making it possible to be an emperor without endless ceremony? I somehow think, sire, that even the cleverest psychohistorian could not manage that. Well, tell me the latest. Is he still hiding among those peculiar bald heads of mycogen? You promised you would winkle him out of there. So I did, sire, and I moved in that direction. But I regret that I must say that I failed. Failed? The emperor allowed himself to frown. I don't like that. Nor I, sire. I plan to have the mathematician be encouraged to commit some blasphemous act. Such acts are easy to commit in mycogen, especially for an outsider, one that would call for severe punishment. The mathematician would then be forced to appeal to the emperor, and as a result we would get him. I planned it at the cost of insignificant concessions on our part, important to mycogen, totally unimportant to us and I meant to play no direct role in the arrangement. It was to be handled subtly. I dare say, said Cleon, but it failed. Did the mayor of Mycogen? He is called the High Elder, sire. Do not quibble over titles. Did this High Elder refuse? On the contrary, sire, he agreed and the mathematician Selden fell into the trap neatly. Well, then? He was allowed to leave unharmed. Why? said Cleon indignantly. Of this I am not certain, sire, but I suspect we were outbid. By whom? By the mayor of Why? Possibly, sire, but I doubt that. I have Why under constant surveillance. If they had gained the mathematician, I would know it by now. The emperor was not merely frowning. He was clearly enraged. Demerzel, this is bad. I am greatly displeased. A failure like this makes me wonder if you are perhaps not the man you once were. What measure shall we take against Mycogen for this clear defiance of the emperor's wishes? Demerzel bowed low in recognition of the storm unleashed, but he said in steely tones, It would be a mistake to move against Mycogen now, sire. The disruption that would follow would play into the hands of Y. But we must do something. Perhaps not, sire. It is not as bad as it may seem. How can it be not as bad as it seems? You'll remember, sire, that this mathematician was convinced that psychohistory was impractical. Of course I remember that, but that doesn't matter, does it, for our purposes? Perhaps not, but if it were to become practical, it would serve our purposes to an infinitely great extent, sire. And 
from what I have been able to find out, the mathematician is now attempting to make psychohistory practical. His blasphemous attempt in mycogen was, I understand, part of an attempt at solving the problem of psychohistory. In that case, it may pay us, sire, to leave him to himself. It will serve us better to pick him up when he is closer to his goal, or has reached it. Not if Y gets him first. That, I shall see to it, will not happen. In the same way that you succeeded in winkling the mathematician out of mycogen just now? I will not make a mistake the next time, sire, said Demerzel coldly. The emperor said, Demerzel, you had better not. I will not tolerate another mistake in this respect. And then he added pettishly, I think I shall not sleep tonight after all. Sixty-two. Girard Tissolver of the doll sector was short. The top of his head came up only to Harry Selden's nose. He did not seem to take that to heart, however. He had handsome, even features, was given to smiling, and sported a thick black mustache and crisply curling black hair. He lived with his wife and a half-grown daughter in an apartment of seven small rooms, kept meticulously clean, but almost bare of furnishings. DeSolver said, I apologize, Master Selden and Mistress Benavoli, that I cannot give you the luxury to which you must be accustomed, but Dahl is a poor sector, and I am not even among the better off among our people. The more reason, responded Selden, that we must apologize to you for placing the burden of our presence upon you. No burden, Master Selden. Master Hummin has arranged to pay us generously for your use of our humble quarters, and the credits would be welcome even if you were not, and you are. Selden remembered Hummin's parting words when they finally arrived in Dahl. Selden, he had said, this is the third place I've arranged a sanctuary. The first two were notoriously beyond the reach of the Imperium, which might well have served to attract their attention. After all, they were logical places for you. This one is different. It is poor, unremarkable, and, as a matter of fact, unsafe in some ways. It is not a natural refuge for you, so that the Emperor and his Chief of Staff may not think to turn their eyes in this direction. Would you mind staying out of trouble this time, then? I will try, Hummin, said Selden, a little offended. Please be aware that the trouble is not of my seeking. I am trying to learn what may well take me thirty lifetimes to learn, if I am to have the slightest chance of organizing psychohistory. I understand, said Hummin. Your efforts at learning brought you to Upperside in Streeling, and to the Elder's Airy in Mycogen, and to who can guess where in Dahl. As for you, Dr. Van Avely, I know you've been trying to take care of Selden, but you must try harder. Get it fixed in your head that he is the most important person on Trantor, or in the galaxy for that matter, and that he must be kept secure at any cost. I will continue to do my best, said Doris stiffly. And as for your host family, they have their peculiarities but they are essentially good people with whom I have dealt before. Try not to get them in trouble either. But Tisalver, at least, did not seem to anticipate trouble of any kind from his new tenants, and his expressed pleasure at the company he now had, quite apart from the rent credits he would be getting, seemed quite sincere. He had never been outside Dahl, and his appetite for tales of distant places was enormous. His wife, too, bowing and smiling, would listen, and their daughter, with a finger in her mouth, 
would allow one eye to peep from behind the door. It was usually after dinner, when the entire family assembled, that Selden and Doris were expected to talk of the outside world. The food was plentiful enough, but it was bland and often tough. So soon after the tangy food of mycogen, it was all but inedible. The table was a long shelf against one wall, and they ate standing up. Gentle questioning by Selden elicited the fact that this was the usual situation among Dalites as a whole, and was not due to unusual poverty. Of course, Mistress DeSolver explained, there were those with high government jobs in Dahl who were prone to adopt all kinds of effete customs, like chairs. She called them body shelves. But this was looked down upon by the solid middle class. Much as they disapproved of unnecessary luxury, though, the DeSolvers loved hearing about it, listening with a virtual storm of tongue-clicking when told of mattresses lifted on legs, of ornate chests and wardrobes, and of a superfluity of tableware. They listened also to a description of Mycogenian customs, while Girard Tisalver stroked his own hair complacently, and made it quite obvious that he would as soon think of emasculation as of depilation. Mistress DeSolver was furious at any mention of female subservience, and flatly refused to believe that the sisters accepted it tranquilly. They seized most, however, on Selden's casual reference to the imperial grounds. When, upon questioning, it turned out that Selden had actually seen and spoken to the emperor, a blanket of awe enveloped the family. It took a while before they dared ask questions, and Selden found that he could not satisfy them. He had not, after all, seen much of the grounds, and even less of the palace interior. That disappointed the Tisalvers, and they were unremitting in their attempts to elicit more. And, having heard of Selden's imperial adventure, they found it hard to believe Dora's assertion that, for her part, she had never been anywhere in the imperial grounds. Most of all, they rejected Selden's casual comment that the emperor had talked and behaved very much as any ordinary human being would. That seemed utterly impossible to the Tisalvers. After three evenings of this, Selden found himself tiring. He had, at first, welcomed the chance to do nothing for a while, during the day at least, but view some of the history book films that Doors recommended. The Tisalvers turned over their book viewer to their guests during the day with good grace, though the little girl seemed unhappy and was sent over to a neighbor's apartment to use theirs for her homework. It doesn't help, Selden said restlessly in the security of his room after he had piped in some music to discourage eavesdropping. I can see your fascination with history, but it's all endless detail. It's a mountainous heap, no, a galactic heap, of data in which I can't see the basic organization. I dare say, said Doors, that there must have been a time when human beings saw no organization in the stars in the sky, but eventually they discovered the galactic structure and I'm sure that took generations, not weeks. There must have been a time when physics seemed a mass of unrelated observations before the central natural laws were discovered, and that took generations. And what of the dissolvers? What of them? I think they're being very nice. They're curious. Of course they are. Wouldn't you be if you were in their place? But is it just curiosity? They seem to be ferociously interested in my meeting with the Emperor. Doris seemed impatient. Again, it's only natural. Wouldn't you be if the situation was reversed? It makes me nervous. 
Haman brought us here. Yes, but he's not perfect. He brought me to the university, and I was maneuvered upper side. He brought us to Sunmaster 14, who entrapped us. You know he did. Twice bitten, at least once shy. I'm tired of being questioned. Then turn the tables, Harry. Aren't you interested in doll? Of course. What do you know about it to begin with? Nothing. It's just one of more than 800 sectors, and I've only been on Trantor a little over two years. Exactly. And there are 25 million other worlds, and I've been on this problem only a little over two months. I tell you, I want to go back to Helicon and take up a study of the mathematics of turbulence, which was my Ph.D. problem, and forget I ever saw, or thought I saw, that turbulence gave an insight into human society. But that evening he said to Tisalver, But, you know, Master Tisalver, you've never told me what you do, the nature of your work. Me? Tisalver placed his fingers on his chest, which was covered by the simple white T-shirt with nothing underneath, which seemed to be the standard male uniform in Dahl. Nothing much. I work at the local Holovision station in programming. It's very dull, but it's a living. And it's respectable, said Mistress DeSolver. It means he doesn't have to work in the heat sinks. The heat sinks, said Doors, lifting her light eyebrows and managing to look fascinated. Oh, well, said DeSolver. That's what Dahl is best known for. It isn't much, but forty billion people on Trantor need energy, and we supply a lot of it. We don't get appreciated, but I'd like to see some of the fancy sectors do without it. Selden looked confused. Doesn't Trantor get its energy from solar power stations in orbit? Some, said Tisalver and some from nuclear fusion stations out on the islands, and some from microfusion motors, and some from wind stations upper side. But half... He raised a finger in emphasis, and his face looked unusually grave. Half comes from the heat sinks. There are heat sinks in lots of places, but none, none as rich as those in Dahl. Are you serious that you don't know about the heat sinks? You sit there and stare at me. Doris said quickly, We are outworlders, you know. She had almost said tribespeople, but had caught herself in time. Especially Dr. Selden. He's only been on Trantor a couple of months. Really? said Mistress DeSalver. She was a trifle shorter than her husband, was plump without quite being fat, had her dark hair drawn tightly back into a bun, and possessed rather beautiful dark eyes. Like her husband, she appeared to be in her thirties. After a period in mycogen, not actually long in duration but intense, it struck Doris as odd to have a woman enter the conversation at will. How quickly modes and manners established themselves, she thought, and made a mental note to mention that to Selden. One more item for his psychohistory. Oh, yes, she said. Dr. Selden is from Helicon. Mistress DeSolver registered polite ignorance. And where might that be? Dora said, Why, it's... She turned to Selden. Where is it, Harry? Selden looked abashed. To tell you the truth, I don't think I could locate it very easily on a galactic model without looking up the coordinates. All I can say is that it's on the other side of the central black hole from Trantor, and getting there by hypership is rather a chore. Mistress DeSolver said, 
I don't think Gerard and I will ever be in a hypership. Some day, Cassilia, said to Solver cheerfully, maybe we will. But tell us about Helicon, Master Selden. Selden shook his head. To me, that would be dull. It's just a world like any other. Only Trantor is different from all the rest. There are no heat sinks on Helicon, or probably anywhere else except Trantor. Tell me about them. Only Trantor is different from all the rest. The sentence repeated itself in Selden's mind, and for a moment he grasped at it. And for some reason, Dor's hand-on-thigh story suddenly recurred to him. But Tisalver was speaking, and it passed out of Selden's mind as quickly as it had entered. Tisalver said, If you really want to know about heat sinks, I can show you. He turned to his wife. Cassilia, would you mind if tomorrow evening I take Master Selden to the heat sinks? And me, said Doris quickly, and Mistress Benaboli. Mistress de Salver frowned and said sharply, I don't think it would be a good idea. Our visitors would find it dull. I don't think so, Mistress de Salver, said Selden ingratiatingly. We would very much like to see the heat sinks. We would be delighted if you would join us too and your little daughter, if she wants to come. To the heat sinks? said Mistress de Salver, stiffening. It's no place at all for a decent woman. Selden felt embarrassed at his gaff. I meant no harm, Mistress de Salver. No offense, said de Salver. Cassilia thinks it's beneath us, and so it is. But as long as I don't work there, it's no distress merely to visit and show it to guests. But it is uncomfortable, and I would never get Cassilia to dress properly. They got up from their crouching positions. Dolite chairs were merely molded plastic seats on small wheels, and they cramped Selden's knees terribly and seemed to wiggle at his least body movement. The dissolvers, however, had mastered the art of sitting firmly, and rose without trouble, and without needing to use their arms for help, as Selden had to. Doris also got up without trouble, and Selden once again marveled at her natural grace. Before they parted to their separate rooms for the night, Selden said to Doris, Are you sure you know nothing about heat sinks? Mistress de Solver makes them seem unpleasant. They can't be that unpleasant, or de Solver wouldn't suggest taking us on tour. Let's be content to be surprised. 63. De Solver said, You'll need proper clothing. Mistress de Solver sniffed markedly in the background. Cautiously, Selden, thinking of Kirtles with vague distress, said, What do you mean by proper clothing? Something light, such as I wear. A T-shirt, very short sleeves, loose slacks, loose underpants, foot socks, open sandals. I have it all for you. Good. It doesn't sound bad. As for Mistress Vanaboli, I have the same. I hope it fits. The clothes to Salver supplied each of them, which were his own, fit fine, if a bit snugly. When they were ready, they bade Mistress to Salver goodbye, and she, with a resigned, if still disapproving air, watched them from the doorway as they set off. It was early evening, and there was an attractive twilight glow above. It was clear that Dahl's lights would soon be winking on. The temperature was mild, and there were virtually no vehicles to be seen. Everyone was walking. In the distance was the ever-present hum of an expressway, and the occasional glitter of its lights could be easily seen. 
The Dalites, Selden noted, did not seem to be walking toward any particular destination. Rather, there seemed to be a promenade going on, a walking for pleasure. Perhaps, if Dahl was an impoverished sector, as de Salver had implied, inexpensive entertainment was at a premium. And what was as pleasant, and as inexpensive, as an evening stroll? Selden felt himself easing automatically into the gait of an aimless stroll himself, and felt the warmth of friendliness all around him. People greeted each other as they passed, and exchanged a few words. Black mustaches of different shape and thickness flashed everywhere, and seemed a requisite for the Dalite male, as ubiquitous as the bald heads of the Mycogenian brothers. It was an evening rite, a way of making sure that another day had passed safely, and that one's friends were still well and happy. And, it soon became apparent, doors caught every eye. In the twilight glow, the ruddiness of her hair had deepened, but it stood out against the sea of black-haired heads, except for the occasional gray, like a gold coin winking its way across a pile of coal. This is very pleasant, said Selden. It is, said Tisalver. Ordinarily, I'd be walking with my wife, and she'd be in her element. There is no one for a kilometer around whom she doesn't know by name, occupation, and interrelationships. I can't do that. Right now, half the people who greet me, I couldn't tell you their names. But in any case, we mustn't creep along too slowly. We must get to the elevator. It's a busy world on the lower levels. They were on the elevator going down when Doris said, I presume, Master Tisalver, that the heat sinks are places where the internal heat of Trantor is being used to produce steam that will turn turbines and produce electricity. Oh, no. Highly efficient, large-scale thermopiles produce electricity directly. Don't ask me the details, please. I'm just a Holovision programmer. In fact, don't ask anyone the details down there. The whole thing is one big black box. It works, but no one knows how. What if something goes wrong? It doesn't usually, but if it does, some expert comes over from somewhere, someone who understands computers. The whole thing is highly computerized, of course. The elevator came to a halt and they stepped out. A blast of heat struck them. It's hot, said Selden, quite unnecessarily. Yes, it is, said Tisalver. That's what makes Dahl so valuable as an energy source. The magma layer is nearer the surface here than it is anywhere else in the world. So you have to work in the heat. How about air conditioning, said Doors. There is air conditioning, but it's a matter of expense. We ventilate and dehumidify and cool. But if we go too far, then we're using up too much energy, and the whole process becomes too expensive. Tisalver stopped at a door at which he signaled. It opened to a blast of cooler air, and he muttered, We ought to be able to get someone to help show us around and he'll control the remarks that Mistress Benaboli will otherwise be the victim of, at least from the men. Remarks won't embarrass me, said Doors. They will embarrass me, said Tisalver. A young man walked out of the office and introduced himself as Haino Lindor. He resembled Tisalver quite closely. But Selden decided that, until he got used to the almost universal shortness, swarthiness, black hair, and luxuriant mustaches, he would not be able to see individual differences easily. Lindor said, I'll be glad to show you around for what there is to see. It's not one of your spectaculars, you know. He addressed them all, but his eyes were fixed on doors. He said, 
It's not going to be comfortable. I suggest we remove our shirts. It's nice and cool in here, said Selden. Of course, but that's because we're executives. Rank has its privileges. Out there, we can't maintain air conditioning at this level. That's why they get paid more than I do. In fact, those are the best-paying jobs in Dahl, which is the only reason we get people to work down here. Even so, it's getting harder to get heat sinkers all the time. He took a deep breath. Okay, out into the soup. He removed his own shirt and tucked it into his waistband. Tesalver did the same, and Selden followed suit. Lindor glanced at Doors and said, For your own comfort, mistress, but it's not compulsory. That's all right, said Doors, and removed her shirt. Her brassiere was white, unpadded, and showed considerable cleavage. Mistress, said Lindor, that's not... He thought a moment, then shrugged and said, All right, we'll get by. At first, Selden was aware only of computers and machinery, huge pipes, flickering lights, and flashing screens. The overall light was comparatively dim, though individual sections of machinery were illuminated. Selden looked up into the almost darkness. He said, Why isn't it better lit? It's lit well enough where it should be, said Lindor. His voice was well modulated, and he spoke quickly, but a little harshly. Overall illumination is kept low for psychological reasons. Too bright is translated in the mind into heat. Complaints go up when we turn up the lights, even when the temperature is made to go down. Doris said, it seems to be well computerized. I should think the operations could be turned over to computers altogether. This sort of environment is made for artificial intelligence. Perfectly right, said Lindor. But neither can we take a chance on any failures. We need people on the spot if anything goes wrong. A misfunctioning computer can raise problems up to 2,000 kilometers away. So can human error, isn't that so? said Selden. Oh, yes. But with both people and computers on the job, computer error can be more quickly tracked down and corrected by people. And, conversely, human error can be more quickly corrected by computers. What it amounts to is that nothing serious can happen unless human error and computer error take place simultaneously. And that hardly ever happens. Hardly ever, but not never, eh? said Selden. Almost never, but not never. Computers aren't what they used to be, and neither are people. That's the way it always seems, said Selden, laughing slightly. No, no, I'm not talking memory. I'm not talking good old days. I'm talking statistics. At this, Selden recalled Humman talking of the degeneration of the times. See what I mean? said Lindor, his voice dropping. There's a bunch of people at the C3 level, from the looks of them, drinking. Not one of them is at his or her post. What are they drinking? asked Doors. Special fluids for replacing electrolyte loss. Fruit juice. You can't blame them, can you? said Doris indignantly. In this dry heat, you would have to drink. Do you know how long a skilled C3 can spin out a drink? And there's nothing to be done about it either. If we give them five-minute breaks for drinks and stagger them so they don't all congregate in a group, you simply stir up a rebellion. They were approaching the group now. There were men and women, Dahl seemed to be a more or less amphisexual society, and both sexes were shirtless. 
The women wore devices that might be called braziers, but they were strictly functional. They served to lift the breasts in order to improve ventilation and limit perspiration, but covered nothing. Nora said in an aside to Selden, That makes sense, Harry. I'm soaking wet there. Take off your brazier, then, said Selden. I won't lift a finger to stop you. Somehow, said Doors, I guessed you wouldn't. She left her brazier where it was. They were approaching the congregation of people, about a dozen of them. Doris said, If any of them make rude remarks, I shall survive. Thank you, said Lindor. I cannot promise they won't, but I'll have to introduce you. If they get the idea that you two are inspectors and in my company, they'll become unruly. Inspectors are supposed to poke around on their own without anyone from management overseeing them. He held up his arms. Heat sinkers, I have two introductions to make. We have visitors from outside, two outworlders, two scholars. They've got worlds running short on energy, and they've come here to see how we do it here in Dahl. They think they may learn something. They'll learn how to sweat, shouted a heat sinker, and there was raucous laughter. She's got a sweaty chest right now, shouted a woman, covering up like that. Dora shouted back. I'd take it off, but mine can't compete with yours. The laughter turned good-natured. But one young man stepped forward, staring at Selden with intense, deep-set eyes, his face set into a humorless mask. He said, I know you. You're the mathematician. He ran forward, inspecting Selden's face with eager solemnity. Automatically, Doris stepped in front of Selden, and Lindor stepped in front of her, shouting, Back, heat sinker. Mind your manners. Selden said, Wait. Let him talk to me. Why is everyone piling in front of me? Lindor said in a low voice, if any of them get close, you'll find they don't smell like hothouse flowers. I'll endure it, said Selden brusquely. Young man, what is it you want? My name is Amaril. You go, Amaril. I've seen you on Holovision. You might have, but what about it? I don't remember your name. You don't have to. You talked about something called psychohistory. You don't know how I wish I hadn't. What? Nothing. What is it you want? I want to talk to you, just for a little while, now. Selden looked at Lindor, who shook his head firmly. Not while he's on his shift. When does your shift begin, Mr. Amaril? asked Selden. Sixteen hundred. Can you see me tomorrow at fourteen hundred? Sure. Where? Selden turned to Tisalver. Would you permit me to see him in your place? Tisalver looked very unhappy. It's not necessary. He's just a heat sinker. Selden said, He recognized my face. He knows something about me. He can't be just an anything. I'll see him in my room. And then, as de Salver's face didn't soften, he added, My room, for which rent is being paid, and you'll be at work out of the apartment. De Salver said in a low voice, It's not me, Master Selden. It's my wife, Cassilia. She won't stand for it. I'll talk to her, said Selden grimly. She'll have to. 64. Cassilia Tisalver opened her eyes wide. A heat sinker? Not in my apartment. Why not? Besides, he'll be coming to my room, said Selden, at 1400. I won't have it, said Mistress Tisalver. This is what comes of going down to the heat sinks. 
Gerard was a fool. Not at all, Mistress de Salver. We went at my request, and I was fascinated. I must see this young man, since that is necessary to my scholarly work. I'm sorry if it is, but I won't have it. Doris Vanabelli raised her hand. Harry, let me take care of this. Mistress de Salver, if Dr. Selden must see someone in his room this afternoon, the additional person naturally means additional rent. We understand that. For today, then, the rent on Dr. Selden's room will be doubled. Mistress de Salver thought about it. Well, that's decent of you, but it's not only the credits. There's the neighbors to think of. A sweaty, smelly heat sinker. I doubt that he'll be sweaty and smelly at fourteen hundred, Mistress de Salver. But let me go on. Since Dr. Selden must see him, then if he can't see him here, he'll have to see him elsewhere. But we can't run here and there. That would be too inconvenient. Therefore, what we will have to do is to get a room elsewhere. It won't be easy, and we don't want to do it, but we will have to. So we will pay the rent through today and leave, and, of course, we will have to explain to Master Hummin why we have had to change the arrangements that he so kindly made for us. Wait! Mistress de Salver's face became a study of calculation. We wouldn't like to disoblige Master Hummin, or you two. How long would this creature have to stay? He's coming at fourteen hundred. He must be at work at sixteen hundred. He will be here for less than two hours, perhaps considerably less. We will meet him outside, the two of us, and bring him to Dr. Selden's room. Any neighbors who see us will think he is an outworlder friend of ours. Mistress de Salver nodded her head. Then let it be as you say. Double rent for Master Selden's room for today, and the heat sinker will visit just this one time. Just this one time, said Doris. But later, when Selden and Doris were sitting in her room, Doris said, Why do you have to see him, Harry? Is interviewing a heat sinker important to psychohistory, too? Selden thought he detected a small edge of sarcasm in her voice, and he said tartly, I don't have to base everything on this huge project of mine, in which I have very little faith anyway. I am also a human being with human curiosities. We were down in the heat sinks for hours, and you saw what the working people there were like. They were obviously uneducated. They were low-level individuals, no play on words intended. And yet here was one who recognized me. He must have seen me on Holovision on the occasion of the decennial convention, and he remembered the word psychohistory. He strikes me as unusual, as out of place somehow, and I would like to talk to him. Because it pleases your vanity to have become known even to heat sinkers in Dahl, well, perhaps, but it also piques my curiosity. And how do you know he hasn't been briefed and intends to lead you into trouble as has happened before? Selden winced. I won't let him run his fingers through my hair. In any case, we're more nearly prepared now, aren't we? And I'm sure you'll be with me. I mean, you let me go upper side alone. You let me go with Raindrop 43 to the microfarms alone, and you're not going to do that again, are you? You can be absolutely sure I won't, said Doris. Well then, I'll talk to the young men, and you can watch out for traps. I have every faith in you. 65. Emeril arrived a few minutes before 1400, looking warily about. His hair was neat, and his thick mustache was combed and turned up slightly at the edges. His T-shirt was startlingly white. He did smell, but it was a fruity odor that undoubtedly came from the slightly over-enthusiastic use of scent. 
He had a bag with him. Selden, who had been waiting outside for him, seized one elbow lightly, while Doris seized the other, and they moved rapidly into the elevator. Having reached the correct level, they passed through the apartment into Selden's room. Amaril said in a low, hang-dog voice, Nobody home, huh? Everyone's busy, said Selden neutrally. He indicated the only chair in the room, a pad directly on the floor. No, said Amaril. I don't need that. One of you two use it. He squatted on the floor with a graceful downward motion. Doors imitated the movement, sitting on the edge of Selden's floor-based mattress. But Selden dropped down rather clumsily, having to make use of his hands, and unable quite to find a comfortable position for his legs. Selden said, Well, young man, why do you want to see me? Because you're a mathematician. You're the first mathematician I ever saw close up, so I could touch him, you know. Mathematicians feel like anyone else. Not to me, Dr. Dr. Selden? That's my name. Amaril looked pleased. I finally remembered. You see, I want to be a mathematician, too. Very good. What's stopping you? Amaril suddenly frowned. Are you serious? I presume something is stopping you. Yes, I'm serious. What's stopping me is, I'm a dollite, a heat sinker on doll. I don't have the money to get an education, and I can't get the credits to get an education. A real education, I mean. All they taught me was to read and cipher and use a computer, and then I knew enough to be a heat sinker. But I wanted more, so I taught myself. In some ways, that's the best kind of teaching. How did you do that? I knew a librarian. She was willing to help me. She was a very nice woman, and she showed me how to use computers for learning mathematics. And she set up a software system that would connect me with other libraries. I'd come on my days off and on mornings after my shift. Sometimes she'd lock me in her private room so I wouldn't be bothered by people coming in, or she would let me in when the library was closed. She didn't know mathematics herself, but she helped me all she could. She was oldish, a widow lady. Maybe she thought of me as a kind of son or something. She didn't have children of her own. Maybe, thought Selden briefly, there was some other emotion involved too, but he put the thought away. None of his business. I liked number theory, said Amaril. I worked some things out from what I learned from the computer and from the book films it used to teach me mathematics. I came up with some new things that weren't in the book films. Selden raised his eyebrows. That's interesting. Like what? I've brought some of them to you. I've never showed them to anyone. The people around me... He shrugged. They'd either laugh or be annoyed. Once I tried to tell a girl I knew, but she just said I was weird and wouldn't see me any more. Is it all right for me to show them to you? Quite all right, believe me. Selden held out his hand, and after a brief hesitation, Amaril handed him the bag he was carrying. For a long time, Selden looked over Amaril's papers. The work was naive in the extreme, but he allowed no smile to cross his face. He followed the demonstrations, not one of which was new, of course, or even nearly new, or of any importance. But that didn't matter. Selden looked up. Did you do all of this yourself? Emeril, looking more than half frightened, nodded his head. Selden extracted several sheets. What made you think of this? His finger ran down a line of mathematical reasoning. Emeril looked it over, frowned, and thought about it. 
Then he explained his line of thinking. Selden listened and said, Did you ever read a book by Annette Bigel? On number theory? The title was Mathematical Deduction. It wasn't about number theory particularly. Emeril shook his head. I never heard of him. I'm sorry. He worked out this theorem of yours three hundred years ago. Emeril looked stricken. I didn't know that. I'm sure you didn't. You did it more cleverly, though. It's not rigorous, but... What do you mean, rigorous? It doesn't matter. Selden put the papers back together in a sheaf, restored it to the bag, and said, Make several copies of all this. Take one copy, have it dated by an official computer, and place it under computerized seal. My friend here, Mistress Van Abelly, can get you into Streeling University without tuition on some sort of scholarship. You'll have to start at the beginning and take courses in other subjects than mathematics, but... By now, Amarel had caught his breath. Into Streeling University? They won't take me. Why not? Doris, you can arrange it, can't you? I'm sure I can. No, you can't, said Amarel hotly. They won't take me. I'm from Dahl. Well, they won't take people from Dahl. Selden looked at Doors. What's he talking about? Doris shook her head. I really don't know. Emeril said, You're an outworlder, mistress. How long have you been at Streeling? A little over two years, Mr. Emeril. Have you ever seen Dahlites there? Short, curly black hair, big mustaches? There are students with all kinds of appearances. But no Dahlites. Look again the next time you're there. Why not, said Selden. They don't like us. We look different. They don't like our mustaches. You can shave your... But Selden's voice died under the other's furious glance. Never. Why should I? My mustache is my manhood. You shave your beard. That's your manhood, too. To my people, it is the mustache. Selden looked at Doris again and murmured, Bald heads, mustaches, madness. What? said Amaril angrily. Nothing. Tell me what else they don't like about Dalites. They make up things not to like. They say we smell. They say we're dirty. They say we steal. They say we're violent. They say we're dumb. Why do they say all this? Because it's easy to say it, and it makes them feel good. Sure, if we work in the heat sinks, we get dirty and smelly. If we're poor and held down, some of us steal and get violent. But that isn't the way it is with all of us. How about those tall yellow hairs in the Imperial Sector who think they own the galaxy? No, they do own the galaxy. Don't they ever get violent? Don't they steal sometimes? If they did my job, they'd smell the way I do. If they had to live the way I have to, they'd get dirty too. Who denies that there are people of all kinds in all places, said Selden. No one argues the matter. They just take it for granted. Master Selden, I've got to get away from Trantor. I have no chance on Trantor, no way of earning credits, no way of getting an education, no way of becoming a mathematician, no way of becoming anything but what they say I am, a worthless nothing. This last was said in frustration and desperation. Selden tried to be reasonable. The person I'm renting this room from is a Dalite. He has a clean job. He's educated. Oh, sure, 
said Amaril passionately. There are some. They let a few do it so that they can say it can be done. And those few can live nicely as long as they stay in Dahl. Let them go outside and they'll see how they're treated. And while they're in here, they make themselves feel good by treating the rest of us like dirt. That makes them yellow hairs in their own eyes. What did this nice person you're renting this room from say when you told him you were bringing in a heat sinker? What did he say I would be like? They're gone now. Wouldn't be in the same place with me. Selden moistened his lips. I won't forget you. I'll see to it that you'll get off Trantor and into my own university in Helicon, once I'm back there myself. Do you promise that, your word of honor, even though I'm a Dalite? The fact that you're a Dalite is unimportant to me. The fact that you are already a mathematician is. But I still can't quite grasp what you're telling me. I find it impossible to believe that there would be such unreasoning feeling against harmless people. Emeril said bitterly, That's because you've never had any occasion to interest yourself in such things. It can all pass right under your nose, and you wouldn't smell a thing, because it doesn't affect you. Dora said, Mr. Emeril, Dr. Selden is a mathematician like you and his head can sometimes be in the clouds. You must understand that. I am a historian, however. I know that it isn't unusual to have one group of people look down upon another group. There are peculiar and almost ritualistic hatreds that have no rational justification and that can have their serious historical influence. It's too bad. Emeril said, Saying something is too bad is easy. You say you disapprove, which makes you a nice person. And then you can go about your own business and not be interested anymore. It's a lot worse than too bad. It's against everything decent and natural. We're all of us the same. Yellow hairs and black hairs, tall and short, Easterners, Westerners, Southerners and Outworlders. We're all of us, you and I, and even the Emperor, descended from the people of Earth, aren't we? Descended from what? asked Selden. He turned to look at Doors, his eyes wide. From the people of Earth, shouted Amaril, the one planet on which human beings originated. One planet? Just one planet? The only planet. Sure, Earth. When you say Earth, you mean Aurora, don't you? Aurora? What's that? I mean Earth. Have you never heard of Earth? No, said Selden. Actually not. It's a mythical world, began Doors, that... It's not mythical. It was a real planet. Selden sighed. I've heard this all before. Well, let's go through it again. Is there a Dalite book that tells of Earth? What? Some computer software, then. I don't know what you're talking about. Young man, where did you hear about Earth? My dad told me. Everyone knows about it. Is there anyone who knows about it especially? Did they teach you about it in school? They never said a word about it there. Then how do people know about it? Emeril shrugged his shoulders with an air of being uselessly badgered over nothing. Everyone just does. If you want stories about it, there's Mother Rita. I haven't heard that she's died yet. Your mother? Wouldn't you know... She's not my mother. That's just what they call her, Mother Rita. She's an old woman. She lives in Billy Button, or used to. Where's that? Down in that direction, said Amaril, gesturing vaguely. How do I get there? Get there? You don't want to get there. You'd never come back. 
Why not? Believe me, you don't want to go there. But I'd like to see Mother Ritta. Amaril shook his head. Can you use a knife? For what purpose? What kind of knife? A cutting knife, like this. Amaril reached down to the belt that held his pants tight about his waist. A section of it came away, and from one end there flashed out a knife blade, thin, gleaming, and deadly. Dora's hand immediately came down hard upon his right wrist. Amaril laughed. I wasn't planning to use it. I was just showing it to you. He put the knife back in his belt. You need one in self-defense, and if you don't have one, or if you have one but don't know how to use it, you'll never get out of Billy Button alive. Anyway, he suddenly grew very grave and intent. Are you really serious, Master Selden, about helping me get to Helicon? Entirely serious. That's a promise. Write down your name and where you can be reached by hypercomputer. You have a code, I suppose. My shift in the heat sinks has one. Will that do? Yes. Well, then, said Amaril, looking up earnestly at Selden. This means I have my whole future riding on you, Master Selden, so please don't go to Billy Button. I can't afford to lose you now. He turned beseeching eyes on doors and said softly, Mistress Venabili, if he'll listen to you, don't let him go. Please. Please.